Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of September 7th, 2017. I'm City Council Bill White and I will be presiding tonight. Um, and we will uh, start with our customary uh, public comment section where we invite the public to speak on any topic. It's, it doesn't have to be um, re related to the agenda in any way. Uh, we ask that you respect the decorum of the chamber and that we also ask that you uh, when you step up, please state your name and address for the public record. Also understand that this is your moment to speak and the council is constrained from speaking, principally to conform with Massachusetts general law because we can't discuss items that are not posted on the agenda. So um, with that said, uh, Amy Bookbinder. Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue in Leeds. And I'm going to make the shortest comment I've ever made. Um, I'm here to strongly support the Medicare for All resolution. And I want to thank everyone for bringing it forward. So I hope we get final approval tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else interested in speaking tonight? OK. Um, I'm going to ask the, the interim administrative assistant, that's a very big type, uh, to call the roll. Councillor Bidwell. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Klein. Here. Councillor Labarge. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. All right, we have a quorum. Um, so we start with uh, an announced public hearing. This is item 17.343. This is a public hearing regarding National Grid Poll Petition for Elm Street at St. John's Church, and this is continued from August 17th. Um, this is in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 156 of the General Laws, requiring that a public hearing will be held on the petition of a National Grid to erect poll wires upon, along, under, or across one or more public ways. I accept a motion to open the public hearing. Motion is made and seconded. Uh, Council LaBarge and then Council O'Donnell. Uh, all those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. Uh, so first we'll hear from the petitioner, uh, Lisa. Hi, I apologize. I was just speaking with uh, another customer about another issue. So um, was it first Arch Street? Because Arts, uh, the, the St. John's uh, Pole. So St. John's Pole, St. John's is intending to do an addition in the back of the church where they'll need three-phase power, and it's really kind of a tight situation. And um, this was kind of a really, we're going to squeak in uh, transformers, a couple poles down, and get their three-phase secondary to the, but, but it would have to come to this new pole in order to serve them, because we need to get directly across the street from where the pole is on their property so we don't have an aerial trespass pass is what we call it so that is the poll that we are looking for on Elm Street and I have a memo from Felix Harvey to uh, the department chair of uh, the department head of uh, the DPW saying that they've uh, they reviewed the records and visited the site to view the proposed possible addition of the poll number 8-50 on Elm Street 203 from the intersection of Bedford Terrace, and there are no apparent conflicts with underground city utilities or public shade trees in the proposed location of the new pole. Um, any other proponents or opponents or anyone just interested in commenting on this? On this, Sean, if you could just identify yourself too. In Good evening. My name is Sean Allen. I live in Whateley, Massachusetts. I'm here as chair of the Second Century Campaign um, for St. John's, which is what we're calling our expansion elevator project. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity. We're, we're needing three-phase power to power an elevator. Primary goal is uh, handicap accessibility to our 126-year-old uh, building, which has uh, very uh, antiquated systems. Uh, that is the primary goal. That is what we're after. Uh, are there any questions of the petitioners or anyone else wishing to speak on this item? I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. 
Thank you very much. That's one. So, Lisa, yeah, while you're standing, we also have um, <coughs> item 17363. This is the public hearing regarding National Grid Poll uh, petition for Arch Street. Um, I'll accept a motion to open the, open the public second. hearing. And motions made by Council O'Donnell and seconded by Council LaBarge. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. This request is for a, what we call a mid-span pole. There's poles along the street, and if anybody has been up Arch Street recently, you can see that a lot of the older poles have recently been replaced and are in the process of getting swapped over. This particular pole, 9 and a half, it um, falls pretty directly between pole 9 and 10. Right now, the customer up at the top of the hill, and as you know, uh, it's a pretty steep hill where houses are. Uh, their service was ripped off of the house when a tree came down and took a very long service from pole 10 to the house. They're now trying to reroute that, and at this point, the service is tied to a tree, which we don't find safe to be safe practice, and we would need to set this mid-span pole to actually hit the new point of attachment on the house to get clearance when it gets up high, in, you know, high enough to, you know, when they're out in their out in their yard, you've got to you know pull up high, or I'm sorry, a house up high. You need to have the pull, you know, there to make sure you get the clearance for people that are out in the yard. Uh, this also has um, their uh, a memo from the uh, DPW saying there are no apparent conflicts with underground city utilities or public shade trees in the proposed location. Uh, anyone else wish to speak to this petition? Any questions? I'll accept the motion. The close the hearing. Motion is made and seconded. Uh, uh, Councilor Bidwell, sorry. Uh, all those in favor of closing public hearing, please say aye. 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 And, and anyone opposed? Okay. All right. So that will come up for vote in the in the consent agenda. So we also this is. Uh, this is an announcement of a public hearing, which means we'll be seeing Lisa again in all likelihood. So this is uh, item 17365, poll petition for National Grid on Woodmont Road. And this is an announcement for a public hearing. Oh, okay. Then that'll take place on September 21st, our next meeting here in the council chambers at 7.05. Uh, and this is on the petition to erect poles, wires, pond, along, under, or across one or more public ways. So put it on your calendar. Be sure not to miss that. So, okay. thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I'm not sure why this is out of the public, uh, out of the consent agenda, the approval of the minutes. Um, Pam made a mistake. Okay, so that would be in the consent agenda. Okay, we'll continue. Or, well, she said something about you should handle it separately. Okay. Since it's not in we'll, there. Okay, since it's not in there, we'll, we'll do that directly. Uh, approval of the August 17 meeting. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay. <coughs> Extensions. Now we come up to uh, recognition one meeting, uh, one minute announcements uh, by counselors. Counselors, anybody got something? Councilor Shara. I have two. Uh, so the first is that the second annual Jackson Street School Carnival is coming up on Saturday, September 16th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's at Jackson Street School. Um, and I don't, anyone who went last year knows that it was a really fun, amazing time. Um, there are games and prizes, a dunk tank, uh, inflatable obstacle course, um, and a temporary tattoo parlor. So everyone should go to that. Again, September 16th, Saturday, 10 to 4. Um, and the other announcement I have is that um, this, tomorrow, this Friday, um, for the Arts Night Out, there's the Chalk Art Festival, um, which goes from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. They'll be creating chalk art uh, downtown, and then um, the top three will be awarded, the top three um, artists and uh, their drawings will be um, awarded their awards by the mayor at 5 o'clock at City Hall, and there's a family free draw behind Thorns from 5 to 7. That's it. Anyone else? Um, the library would like you to know that uh, on September 22nd from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the library will be an opportunity to enjoy wine, music, food, and conversation. <clears throat> There's a wine tasting and tickets are $30 per person. They may be purchased at the Forbes Library at 
wforbeslibrary.org or liquors 44 um, so put that on your calendar also <coughs> there will be <coughs> I can't believe that we're talking about something in October but here you go this is on October 9th uh, the Pulaski Day Parade of by the um, that's put on by the Polish Heritage Committee of Northampton will be the 31st annual Pulaski Day Parade in Northampton uh, counselors are invited to attend and the public's uh, uh, to participate and the public's invited to attend and um, yeah, it's the part of our parade, start of the parade season, basically. So, so. Uh, anyone else? All right. So now we come up. Uh, the mayor does have a proclamation. He alerted me to. So, Your Honor. Yes. Good evening, uh, counselors. Um, I do have a, a special proclamation to issue this evening. Um, it's uh, it's in honor of Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, September 2017. Uh, whereas childhood cancer kills more children in the United States than asthma, pediatric AIDS, cystic fibrosis, diabetes, muscular dystrophy, and genetic anomalies combined. And whereas childhood cancers are a specific set of cancer diseases that affect children, they are not the same types of cancers found in adults. And whereas one in 285 children will develop cancer before the age of 20, and whereas the incidence of childhood cancer is steadily increasing at a rate of 0.6% per year, and no one knows why, and whereas childhood cancers are not the result of lifestyle factors or poor health as are many adult cancers, and whereas 43 kids per day are diagnosed with cancer in the United States, and whereas worldwide a child is diagnosed every two minutes, and whereas the month of September has been designated as a month to extend our support to children and their families who are fighting for a cancer-free life. So now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, hereby proclaim September 2017 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month in the city of Northampton so that together we may shine a light on childhood cancer, stand with those in need, and redouble our efforts to address childhood cancer in our community. In witness whereof I have set my hand and imprinted the seal this seventh day of September in the year 2017. Um, I wanted to invite uh, two young women uh, to accept this, uh, Julia and Emma, who are with um, WeLoveRiley.org, uh, which is a childhood cancer organization. And they actually uh, requested this proclamation from the city of Northampton and several other communities. So I wanted to thank you and present thank it to you. you. And if you want to talk to folks about sure. the organization you're involved in. Thank you in. so much, You're Mayor. welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, city of Northampton. We really appreciate um, you recognizing September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. You might know, as the mayor said, one in 285 children in the United States are diagnosed with pediatric cancer before the age of 20. And worldwide, a child is diagnosed once every two minutes. We are spreading awareness of the color gold to represent childhood cancer all month during September. And we thank the mayor and we thank the city of Northampton for supporting local and uh, children in the national community and international community as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your thank advocacy. You. Thank you. Um, Wayne here? Yeah, Wayne is here. Okay. Um, so we have a second reading on item 17.372. This is a resolution in support of uh, Senate Bill 619. That's an act to establish Medicare for all in Massachusetts. Motion. Motion's made and seconded to approve. So uh, I think Councilor Labarge, you move to approve? And then you second it? Okay. All right. Uh, any further discussion on this? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. That passes in second reading. And now, Wayne Fudd. This is the Office of Planning and Sustainability presentation. This is an open space recreation and multi use plan from uh, Director Wayne Fudd. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So Don's putting this presentation up. So just most of you haven't, weren't on the council seven years ago, so I just want to give you some quick 
discussion of what we're doing um, and where we're going in this process. So every seven years, the city adopts a open space, recreation, multi-use trail plan. And it's our blueprint for areas and all those activities. Um, and it's sort of a Bible. We use it a lot. It's brought in, um, in the last seven years, we've brought in $4 million of grants that are direct, outside grants that doesn't include CBA, that are directly attributable to this to this, uh, so it's an important document for us, both in terms of bringing money and in terms of outlining what we are. Um, what makes the plan more complicated than most is we try to get adopted by a lot of different boards. Um, and so that means that we go through the process. We can't go to a board and, and have them you know, make a few changes and go to the next board and have a few more changes because it's hard to go back. So we try to sort of figure out a way to keep the dialogue going as we go through the planning process. So when we go through the actual adoption, there's no surprises in the process. Um, under state law, planning board's the only board that has to adopt the plan. Um, but we think it's important to go to other boards because the plan cuts across all those areas. So we're looking at doing accessibility for conservation and recreation, so we need to go to the Disabilities Committee. And obviously, we can't do anything without you approving most things, so we want your endorsement, and we're dealing with conservation land and recreation land, so we want those boards' endorsement. So what we tend to do is ask the planning board to adopt the plan and ask every other board to endorse the plan, saying you're agreeing on most things and you get a chance to vote on things separately in the process. Um, so what I want to do is just sort of, when we did the plan seven years ago, it had 13 broad objectives that we tried to do. And I'm going to walk you through those 13 areas, talk just very briefly about what we've accomplished in the last seven years, and then talk sort of at the brainstorming level what we think might be the objectives for the next seven years. Um, and then talk about sort of the public process. But again, we'll be coming back to you probably in December or January asking you to, to endorse the plan. So we want to get your input both now and you know the next few months to, to share things. <laughs> Good to know it wasn't me. Oh. Wow. That, that's a ring. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> oh, that's a ring. <laughs> so uh, if you read the plan, it's a very long document. And it's because we have to meet the state standards. Most of them I'm not going to talk about. Half the plan is just inventory of all the land that we own. Um, and all the goals that we have from our open from our uh, comprehensive plan. So again, I'm just focusing on these 13 broad areas. So the first one is conservation management. How do we actually manage our properties? Um, in the last seven years, we've been really successful and had a lot of advances. Um, we've been very aggressive about removing exotic plants. Although I have to say, we still are falling behind. So probably everything I'm talking about tonight, I'm really proud of. The removal of exotic plants is the one area where we're still, even even after doing a lot of work, we're still further behind than we were seven years ago. And that's true th sort of throughout the country. Um, we now have a half-time lands manager, and so that's been great about getting us to clean up a lot of our backlog of, of things, and actually great about letting us do a lot of work at lower cost. So just as, as one example, we hired Ty and Bond about eight years ago to look at the Fitzgerald Lake Dam. And they came up with a series of recommendations which would have cost about $300,000 to rehab the dam. We're about halfway through the list, and we've spent less than $15,000. Um, and that's because we've had a person who's done a lot of the work. We've had lots of volunteers. And so we found better ways to get to the same thing. So it's important to, for example, one of the things we've done so far is armoring the dam. You all know there's a hurricane going on, two hurricanes going on right now. Um, and the dam looks great, but if you start having a big hurricane, the water was turbulent. It could actually start washing away the dam. So we've brought in about 200 tons of, of flat rocks to put along the water's edge. So if the water's turbulent, it's not going to eat away at the dam. So it's that kind of thing we've been trying to catch up on. Um, we've redone all. We used to have signs that were made up from pressed tree wood and not in great shape. We've cleaned up all the signs. So just done a series of events. So we think our conservation areas are in much better shape. Um, and particularly, it's about habitat management. Our, our top goal for managing property is for, for habitat preservation. Um, so going forward for the next seven years, we hope to do more of the same and manage these properties better. We have a few sort of focus areas we want to do a little better job on. Um, we've always paid attention to environmental justice 
for this basically low income and minority communities. How well are they being served? Um, we want to think about those a little bit more. So just as one example, we now have two community garden areas in the city. Um, the Florence Organic Fields that Grow Food North Hampton runs and the property on Burt's Pit Road that the city runs. 800 plots, that's enough to serve most of our population with cars who go to community gardens. But we have residents in low-income housing projects who may not have cars and may not have the ability to go do them. So we're looking at little mini areas. At River Run, can we build a 20-plot um, community gardens? No one's going to drive there unless you're in River Run, but it's great to serve the residents of River Run who frankly aren't necessarily being served by the other areas. And so it's, it's that kind of thing we want to focus on. We've played with just this one big goal. We have lots of miles of trails and people are walking all the time there. But we don't, like Amherst does and like East Hampton does, we don't have one trail that goes the entire length. So we've talked about a Northampton one trail, or maybe some other term, that basically is you know a 20 mile trail that does a full loop of the city. Um, some people might wanna hike the entire thing, for others it might just be symbolic. So again, trying to draw attention to these areas going, going <coughs> forward. Um, as you know, we've been trying to buy a lot of open space in pristine areas. We have a target of 25% of the city being, this was, we set seven years ago, 25% of the city being preserved is pristine land. We get a lot of attention when the mayor announced that 25% of the city is protected as open space. But just so there's not confusion, that's not the pristine land. That includes Look Park and watershed lands and farmland. So we're about 20% of the city is preserved as pristine. 25% of the city is preserved as something. And so we want to think about what, what that is. Going forward, we just these numbers just targets to think about. But when we set the targets seven years ago, it was what were the targets the next seven years. We need to come back and, and visit that. One of the things we need to do before we set the targets is about every five years, we've done a detailed assessment of looking at what's the actual effects on the tax rolls. What what you know, what is land coming out for conservation and recreation? cost in terms of taxes we're not getting, how is that land redistributed, and so we need to we need to update that assessment going forward, and so we're we'll going to be doing it in the next few months for, for doing it. Um, and then if, if the biggest amount of our conservation areas are pristine land that's primarily about wildlife and about climate change and about, you know, uh, climate protection, all those really important things, we have lots of small conservation areas that serve particular neighborhoods. You wouldn't necessarily fly to Northampton. It's not the crown jewel of Northampton. You wouldn't say this is the most amazing place. But for people who live nearby, it becomes really important. So, you know, Jim Nash was instrumental in getting us to acquire the Montview Avenue conservation area. Really wonderful piece of property that serves the neighborhood. It's not a crown jewel for the city, frankly, but it's really important for that neighborhood, for one of the densest neighborhoods in town. And so we, we, we manage those areas differently because they're really serving the neighborhood. Um, we have a Jeep Eater Trail where we allow Jeeps to go. It's the only place in, in town, one of the few places in the state, where off-road vehicles are embraced by municipalities. But the trail is almost pure rock, so they're not causing damage to conservation areas, and it serves an important recreational need. Um, but we wouldn't claim that's a pristine land. It's, you know, it's, it's part of our mix. So we want to keep thinking about how do we serve those areas. One of the areas that, that comes up a lot is sort of exactly what is our target for that land. So we have the amount of pristine land. We don't really have a target for how much land we're trying to preserve that serve neighbors. So we want to play with that. Um, we've looked in particular at the Jeep Eater Trail. About two-thirds of the Jeep Eater Trail is on our property and a little bit goes off our property. Is that something we want to acquire? Um, with both serves this recreation need, but also it's really important because where we own the land, we keep the Jeeps on the rock so they're not causing problems. Where they leave our property, it may be less controlled. So, trying to think about how do we serve populations, and also, you know, preserve the resource area. Um, the fourth, which we've been really successful in the last few years, has been farmland preservation. You all know we funded a substantial amount of Grow Food Northampton's acquisition, but not from city funds, with some CPA money and a lot of state grants that we got for the process. Um, we've also preserved some farmland in the meadows, so it didn't look any different but we've preserved it in a way that it's never going to go anywhere. The biggest risk to farmland in Northampton 20 and 30 years ago was conversion to, to housing developments. And for the most part, most of the farmland in Northampton is no longer threatened with that kind of conversion because the farmland outside the meadows has mostly been protected, not completely, but mostly. And the farmland in the meadows is floodplain. It's not going to be developed. But the biggest risk we have is actually land just lying fallow and being lost. And so 
preserving farmland for us goes along with this, this next one, which is preserving farmers, right? So we know that we have less land under cultivation today than we did seven years ago. Um, we actually have more farmers. We have young farmers starting up, but some marginal land has been lost. Now, some marginal land is always going to be lost. It doesn't, some of it doesn't make sense for farming, but trying to play with that. And what are the ways that we, we can deal with farming? You all know you just passed recently, um, a passed onto committee discussion about photovoltaics on farmland. And this has been one of the discussions. We had a discussion with the Ag Commission six years ago. They said we shouldn't allow photovoltaics on prime ag land because we don't want to lose prime ag land. Um, but then we're trying to figure out a way to how do we allow enough photovoltaics that we can help give farmers some supplemental income without allowing so much that we're converting farmland and losing the farmland. And so that's what the ordinance that's going through the process now is all about, is trying to think about those things. Um, and so we're playing with, you know, with the Ag Commission and, and different ways to, to protect farmers. Um, so then the sixth category, which we're mostly done with, we're, this is an area where we've been really successful, has been the recreation acquisitions. So we've done two significant purchases at Sheldon Field. You don't see Sheldon Field growing because we're sort of land banking it, so it's still being farmed. But we own some land there that will serve future generations when, when we need it. We did a major acquisition at Connecticut River Greenway, and we did a massive acquisition at what's now Florence Fields. So we created a, you know, a new, our largest recreation area is, is brand new. So we've been very successful here. Going forward, we don't have any huge acquisitions, but there'd be some small ones. Sheldon Field is still sort of checkerboarded. We own main, the main parcel you see is recreation, then a couple of farmlands, and there's some private land in between. As those properties become available, we'd like to fill in the checkerboard. Again, no immediate plans for Sheldon Field, but that's, that's an opportunity at some point in the future. Um, there may be some other things. We get grants which have different conditions, and you know we've done, expanded our bike path network with different funding. Um, one of the funding sources that's very attractive only lets us um, use it if land's protected, if the city actually owns the land as open space. Some of our bike paths in town we own by easement. So, and they're perfectly protected, we can use them just fine, but we're not eligible for grants. Um, and so we may want to come back and ac acquire some of those properties. So for example, in Leeds, we expanded the rail trail north a third of a mile earlier this year. Where that trail ends was actually not where we ran out of money. It ends where, where we switch from owning the land and fee to where we own it only by easement. And so we weren't eligible to use that money to go further north. So we may want to play with some of those things in the coming years. Um, and then what we had seven years ago is two separate goals. One was recreation and park development. And the second was waterfront park. We're merging them together because the waterfront park's done. We all see them there. And, and again, this area has been really successful. Obviously, the, the marquee project was the, the various stages of Pulaski Park, which is now virtually done. Um, and that was the biggest budget item and probably the, the biggest effect in the city in a long time in the park side of thing, things. And then Florence Fields on the recreation area and Connecticut River Greenway on a, on a specific type of recreation. So very successful in that. And so we need to start thinking about what are the longer term projects. Again, accessibility is really important. We, we've done a great job. And, and when I say accessibility is important, we're probably more successful at making our areas accessible than most towns. We just completed an audit of all of our conservation areas and recreation areas, and we're doing really well. But we also have some, some opportunities to go further. Um, so accessibility is a goal. Certainly thinking about the Northampton Community Rowing has a semi-permanent boathouse. It probably has a life of about 10 years. They want to think on a longer-term boathouse. That's primarily going to be them who's doing that. But we want to think about what's our role in terms of supporting it. And then recreation still working on their priorities. Um, but both Sheldon Field and Mains Field haven't been rehabbed in a long time, and at some point we have to think about the cycle for, for doing grants there. And so you see that Look Park is not here. So Look Park is technically owned by the city but privately managed. So they're eligible for the same grants that we do, but we don't really do their long-term planning. So the fact that Look Park isn't on here doesn't mean they're not doing lots in terms of recreation development. It's just not what, what we're including in our plan. Um, Ninth one's recreation maintenance. You know, the DPW maintenance division is doing a good job maintaining um, recreation areas. One of the things that's been new in the last few years is there's now a Friends of Northampton Parks and Recreation Group 
um, that works very closely with the Department of Parks and Recreation and, and the Parks and Recreation uh, Commission. Um, but they have an opportunity to do outside fundraising to bring a community in. They've primarily been focused on um, uh, uh, Florence Fields, but they've worked on some other projects with us. So we have to put conservation restrictions on some on various properties we buy, and they've been willing to hold conservation restrictions. They've actually lowered our cost. When we preserve land and have to put a restriction on it, they're much lower cost than other options. So, so that's been wonderful going forward. And the only change I know this is subtle, but seven years ago we called it recreation maintenance. Now I want to think about recreation management. And just, you know, it's subtly different in terms of this isn't just about DPW responding to a ticket that something should be fixed, but just sort of thinking philosophically about the approach. So the mayor initiated a program where Florence Fields is managed organically. And that isn't just a series of steps from managing, so not using herbicide. That isn't just a series of steps. That sort of has to be a fundamental systems approach for how do you manage that. And it's still a test. It partly works, partially doesn't work. Um, but sort of thinking about those sort of more systems thinking type approach. And then partnerships, particularly I'm thinking about the Friends of Northampton Recreation, but there may be other partners moving forward as well. Um, Multi-use trail development, you know, it's another area. I think we've been very successful. We've done everything from the park and ride lot in Leeds, and part of the park and ride lot, we slipped in a, a bike path access point. Um, we're trying to have places so people, so the park and ride lot works during the week for people going to work. And on the weekend, if you want to you bicycle, you don't have to park in a neighborhood. You can park right there and get on the bike ride. Um, we bought the land in Connecticut River Greenway, which is Someday, this is many, many years in the future, is a bike path all the way to Elm Court and Hatfield. Um, we just closed on land in June off Burt's Pit Road. It's primarily a conservation area, but that's partially extending a bike path all the way up to the sort of the Ryan Road School neighborhood. Mass Central Trail in Leeds, I mentioned we just expanded that. Um, and then obviously a major construction project um, going on is the tunnel underneath the, the bike path. Um, then suddenly, I know this is a digression, but you may start getting calls for, for, for many months, people have been slipping by and walking, using the trail. At least it's been a construction site. As of yesterday, it looks like it's done, but it's still barricaded. So you may start getting calls from your constituents why is it barricaded when it looks like it's done? And that's because it's, it's closed to the public as long as the contractor owns it, because they're responsible for the liability, and it can't be done until National Grid gives them power. Um, so there's still, we need, we ask for lights as a safety measure, we ask for closed circuit uh, cameras as a safety measure. So the contractor sort of pulled off the site for a little while, but they still own the site and won't be back till there's power. So it's barricaded, people shouldn't be going there, um, or at least we shouldn't be blessing people going there. So, um, so going forward, um, looking at a few things, so, so the mayor just announced yesterday that we've signed up for a, a bike share program that's a regional bike share program that's 500 bikes that are electric assist bikes. Um, and the reason electric assist is really important for this bike share program is that we know the typical demographic who rides bikes in this community and everywhere else is um, young professionals in their 20s and 30s. Other people ride, you know, I'm not in my 20s and 30s and I ride. but. You know, we know by far that's the biggest demographic. And we're trying, we, we have a strong commitment to social justice. We want our bike share to serve all populations, all incomes, all physical levels. And the, assist, the, the bike assistance lets that work. The problem is, as of today, we don't allow a electric assisted bike on the bike pass. You see a lot of them out there. If you go to any bike pass and sit there for a day, you're going to see some out there. It made sense when city council passed that ordinance some number of years ago, because at the time there really weren't pedal assist bikes. There were electric scooters, and we don't want electric scooters. They go fast, they're heavy, they, um, but electric assisted bikes are sort of a different creature. And so the mayor's announcement sort of forces our hand. We need to think about that. Um, is how we do that. And so uh, we actually have in my office now a, a model bike, which the mayor was riding around today. Um, but you know we can all give you tours. So anytime you want to borrow the electric assist bike and go around and see what it's like, we're, we're absolutely happy to lend it to you and lend you a helmet as well. Um, so that, and then there's lots of bike expand, bike path expansions. I won't go to all of them. Some are 20 years out. You know, going up to Hatfield, going towards the Ryan Road School. That's a very long-term plan. But we do want to think about something different, which is access ramps. So we ha have a target of serving about 75% of the population easily by bike paths. And we're pretty close to that. We're about 65% right now. And we've defined that what's serving easily by how close it is to the bike path. 
But the problem is the distance is a little misleading. So if you're in Leeds, for example, there's an on-ramp to the bike path by, the, by Look Park and by the VA Medical Center Park and Ride Lot. And then there's no single access points until you get all the way up to Mulberry Street. Um, so very long run, you can't get. And so if I quickly buffer the bike path by half a mile, I'll say I'm serving all these people, but they can't get there. And in fact, we're having a problem with what we call desire lines. People are cutting up the hill to get to the bike path because they want to get there so much. And that's great. I have no problem with that. But they're actually causing erosion. DPW has had to do maintenance to, to fix those. And so thinking about on-ramps in Leeds in particular, where this is a strong section, and then on the old historic bike path, the first one we did 35 years ago, where there's a lot of places where the paved roads come within 50 feet of the bike path, but there's no technically legal connection. How do we do on-ramps there? And so again, we're looking at some longer term projects, but the shorter term are in some ways more important. Jackson Street ramp was one of our big successes four years ago, um, where we had a similar thing. We had lots of desire lines that people were going up the hill, but you couldn't really quite get there. And so we're, we want to play with that going forward. Um, and then something that was in our plan seven years ago, but really started taking off about two years ago, is this pavement to parks program. This is taking unloved, unused section of pavement that might be better served as a very small park. So we've done a few of these. Um, we've raised, we had, I think, 200 different donors um, who helped raise $10,000 for Cracker Barrel Alley, and then we were matched by a state grant. Um, we're, we're sort of working with design, need to work with the abutters before we do anything. The abutters had some concerns. We're trying to address those concerns. We have a movable parklet which last year was tested in front of Cracker Bar Alley, this year in front of City Hall. We got a grant from the Center for Disease Control through the State Department of Public Health. But the condition of the grant is it can't stay anywhere for more than a year because we're using it as a test. It's, it's not considered equipment. It's considered a diagnostic. So it moves around as we test different areas. Um, Amber Lane was privately built on city property. Um, as a parklet, you'll be asked to vote later tonight on a parklet right behind you, behind the Roundhouse parking lot. Um, and then just today, the mayor led a tour down, down uh, Pleasant Street for our newest very small parklet right on the corner of Pleasant Street and Hockman Road. So sort of thinking about those efforts, again, these are tiny parklets, but thinking about what are the, you know, what are the opportunities for moving them forward, what are the other places where, where we can have these going forward. There's an additional piece of land on the other side of Hockman Road, which we hope becomes another parklet. I talked about the roundhouse already. So all these things are part of it. And then almost done. Uh, just two more. So we used to just focus on recreation for recreation's sake and conservation for conservation's sake. We started thinking about, and we also separately, you all know this, work very hard to preserve the city's history, whether it's preserving buildings or art murals or other things. Until seven years ago, we hadn't really connected the two. We, we thought about conservation land separate from the landscape. And yet, some of the landscape that we use has a really rich history. So what we call Florence Fields was also part of the underground slave railway. and was an important farm land that's there, that's eligible to be a national register. And um, when we bought some land in Leeds that had a, a house on it and had an old sawmill on it, and the house was falling apart, an old sawmill on it, and some farm implements deep in the woods. Like, you go in the woods, and you can't imagine there's ever farming. But there's a farm implement in the middle of the woods. And so we've started, we used to think, oh, this, this is garbage. We should clean this up. We've now started thinking carefully about how do we preserve that history? You know, I know that the entire state was cleared of trees 100 years ago. My daughter doesn't know that. And so how do we preserve that history so my daughter's wandering through the woods and suddenly sees a farm implement? It's like, oh. That really was true. My dad wasn't lying to me. Um, and so, so we've done more of this about the heritage landscapes. Some of you know we re, we've been trying to rebrand what we used to call the Manhattan Rail Trail. We've now called the New Haven and Northampton Canal Line Trail. Because it goes, if, you go to, if any of you go to one canal street in New Haven where Ikea is, that's the far end of the, the canal that comes right to Northampton. Um, and so we'd like to put that on the map. And so we've been doing a little bit of work in that area. Um, and, and to some of that's just been interpretation. We've been successful. We worked with Leeds Civic on some interpretation in Leeds. We've worked with Northampton Community Rowing on interpretation of the Connecticut River. But we have an acquisition, which you all approved recently, which is partially about building the, the Mineral Hills Conservation Area, but it's partially about preserving lead mines. So 350 years ago, to about 220 years ago, somewhere thereabouts, I'm not exactly sure of the dates, when you needed a bullet, I guess it wasn't called a bullet, but you needed 
to shoot something under your gun, whatever it's called at the time, you would mine it locally. And then some number of years ago, I think when railroads started hitting the Midwest, but again, I'm not, this isn't my area, it started being it was cheaper to produce a bullet in Ohio than to produce it locally. And so all the lead mines collapsed. Um, but there's this wonderful piece of property, spectacular lead mines, some really interesting, you know, all the, all the rock people in town know it because some really interesting minerals are associated with it. But you have these old metal shafts that go down. So trying to think about that, just telling a slightly different story is part of what we're doing. Um, and then finally, what brings some of these together, and we spent a lot of time on this in the last few years, is just how do we tell the message to get people involved? So we've redone all our signs, which used to be in lousy shape, and now I think all of our signs are in good shape. We've redone the, ki the, the kiosks along the bike path, and I think they're all in pretty good shape. Um, we have signs on the, you know, the bridge underneath Main Street, which wasn't just an art project, it was also sort of a wayfinding project. We wanted to send the message on Main Street, what's above. And so those are all been the kind of things we've been working on. And going forward, we're gonna keep trying to work on some of those things. We've gotten out of the printing business, so we don't print brochures anymore. Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways do, but we don't. Um, but we've been trying to think of other ways to get information out that's lower cost to us and, and informs the public. Um, so we're sort of taking this on the road to different boards. You know, our plan is to get each of the original adopting boards early on in the process. That's what I'm here with you tonight. Both so boards know what's going on and solicit comments. We'll be doing a series of workshops and walks. We're going to start on September 16th with a bike ride the length of the, the um, Mass Central uh, path that we're hoping that neighbors come out along the way to say where they think we should have on-ramps and where they don't. Some neighbors want on-ramps desperately. Some neighbors desperately don't want on-ramps. And so as we prioritize for future grants, we want to think about what are the ones that neighborhoods want, at least to the extent there's a consensus. There's not always consensus. For that. So that would be the first thing September 16th. Then we'll be doing a, a workshop on the plan, trying to get people out. We do something like this presentation to say, we're not claiming it's a blank slate. We've been doing this for 40 years, this planning. But we want to get people's input before we've gone too far. Then we go back and start putting together the plan and come back to the community. That date's not quite a set, but hopefully in November we get people's input in the process uh, and then come back to everyone to adopt it. I will say, for those who have been around for a long time, it sounds like we actually have fewer public forums. And it's actually true for two reasons. One is we're trying to use more technology. So we're going to be using wiki mapping, for example, that lets people go onto a map on site and make recommendations. But the other thing is our experience seven years ago was some people would come to four different public hearings and say the same thing four times, and other people would come to one public hearing, and the people who said it four times sort of thought that they should have four times as much weight. And that's really not fair for the people who, can only, you know, who work for a living and only come once. So we're trying to sort of have better hearings, hopefully well attended, but not you know, sort of ones that encourage people to come 12 times. That's what I got. Any questions, comments? Uh, Council of Barge. Um, rain on the boundary markers, because I know on my ward, you worked with me very closely with residents on that, especially when we bought conservation land from our private owners. And apparently, seeing on your plan that apparently you have caught up with all the boundary markers? Is that throughout the city? We haven't or? caught up with all of them. So we um, used to not survey all the property. We're surveying all the property. So we have completed surveying the Mineral Hills, about 95% done through uh, Broadbrook Fitzgerald Lake, and about 90% done through the Salma Hills. So we're almost done with the surveys. Any new property we buy, we're surveying. Um, our conservation manager is going through and marking all the trails. We have two, you see in this picture one of them, we have various markers. We have markers that face out, so when you're entering a conservation area, it tells you what the rules are, and markers that face in. So I would say we're about 70% through marking our property boundaries and about 30% through, in terms of blazes, about 30% through putting these blue things up. But it's absolutely in our program, we are moving forward on that. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, I would just note that, um, first of all, thank you for the presentation and all the work you've done. And at one point you mentioned um, that Northampton in and of itself isn't necessarily a jewel that would attract people from, from far and wide, but it's very important to the local people who live here. And I, I take your point and I think that's right. But I think with the work that you've done and the mayor has done and others over a long period of time, I mean, I think we actually are um, approaching jewel status if we're not 
quite there yet. I think you have something very special for our fans, and I'm just very appreciative of all the work that's gone into it. And a lot of that is public process. So just to add for the record, I noticed you had a list of meetings, and we just spoke today about uh, the Transportation Parking Commission uh, is another date that can be added. Uh, that will be September 19th, Tuesday. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank you too, Wayne, for the for the presentation. And it really is when you, when you see all of that uh, work pulled together, it's it's a, it's an impressive piece of work and a lot of uh, a lot of vision for what's to come. So very very, very impressive. I, had, I did have one question um, on on the on the target of the the revised target of 35 percent for open space, uh, up from 25 percent. What is, is what, what's what what's what's that based on? Is is that just kind of an arbitrary? We've, you know, it's, we we set 25 and we hit it, so therefore we're going to go further. How how do you establish that? Yeah, it, it is sort of arbitrary. There's no magic behind it. So, so certainly that's true. Just to be clear, though, we have the target of 25 percent pristine. We're only suggesting that go to 28 pristine. Right. We had never set a target for total open space. Um, oh, okay. And so that was part of it. It seemed useful to have a target. This partially came out of questions for a council who's no longer here a few years ago who asked, what is the target? And so he asked us to set up a target, and so that's what began the process. Partially, it's, I think, we want, it was a full disclosure thing. Yes, there's no magic to the number, but it seems like it's something that's good about having a community debate. Um, that's out there. The other thing is, I have another target which isn't in here, and this is sort of more cross-cutting, but one of the targets that my office ha has worked on, the mayor certainly supported, is we've really worked hard on trying to make sure in our open space acquisitions we're not artificially inflating the value of land. We're not making it more difficult for a first-time home buyer to buy a building lot. So, so partly the numbers for me are just sort of thinking, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're not competing with places where we really want to have development? So we, you know, you all know we buy a lot of land that comes before you, but we get as, our, as often pitched pieces of land that we pass on that say, no, this is a place that we'd like to be developed, or we do a limited development product. So it's partially based on where do I think we can, what number can we get to without stopping the amount of development that we need so that people who want to live in Northampton can do so affordably. But there's no magic to it. Well, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, I, I, I would argue that rather than pick a number, uh, a, a really comprehensive and strategic planning process that would say, in, in broad terms, these are the areas worthy of protection where there, it's not going to have adverse effects in any development potential, and then calculate what it is. And maybe it, maybe it turns out to be 36 percent, maybe it turns out to be, you know, 20, 27 percent, but, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's based on on-the-ground reality as opposed to picking a number from just, just, a, just an observation. Yep. Um, <clears throat> this may be a silly question, but it's never taught me before. Um, can you define pristine? Is that does that mean have, has never been developed, or that no. is just no nothing longer? in Northampton? I mean, everything was cut down for timber production, okay. sheep doing. So it's a good question. I, I think for us, what we define pristine is our primary management objective is wildlife. So when we do trail work, for, so we've tended to see it's the city's role to preserve land and it's neighborhoods who get to build trails. And some neighborhoods want to build trails and some don't. We don't generally go there. Where we get involved with trails is where we see trails growing, that people keep going around a wet spot, mm -hmm. then we might cover the wet spot for habitat protection. So it's areas where we think, you know, the, the Park Service uses wilderness as a place where man's a visitor. We're more urban areas. That's not quite true. But where's the area we think the impact of people is minimal and we, in essence, have mostly natural systems? Um, as opposed to the places where we're allowing jeeps or that, those kind of things. But it's not, it's definitely not pristine in the sense of National Park Service wilderness areas. Okay. Councilor Klein and then Councilor Nash. Wayne, I have a couple of questions about hunting. It was on the slide, but you didn't talk about yep. it. Um, so you talked about uh, low visitor areas where um, you're thinking about expansion of hunting. Um, and they happen to all be in pretty much in Ward 7, a little bit in Ward 6. Um, and some of those areas are fairly newly acquired. And so when you talk about low visitor areas, I'm wondering, there's kind of a chicken egg thing there. Like, you know, are there ways that we can encourage people to expand their hiking and walking in those areas? 
um, so that they're not low visitor areas and that might preclude hunting in those areas. So I have a question about that. And then the other thing is, is it because of demand, local demands for hunting areas or is it because of um, animal management that we want to expand hunting in the city? What's the rationale behind the idea of um, expanding the hunting area? So let me do the second one first, where the demand comes from. So the demand is definitely about user demand. It's not so much from a wildlife standpoint, um, but it's about user demand in an area which doesn't have adverse impact on wildlife. So, you know, so it doesn't necessarily enhance, you know, if, if you allow deer hunting, for example, what you're reducing is the number of deer who starve to death in a difficult winter, but you're not really a, a cent so there's no disadvantage from hunting for deer in particular. There's no disadvantage for hunting because the deer are going to be starving to death. And, and some people say hunting is more humane. I'm not sure I care about, I'm not sure that's my issue. But it certainly isn't harming the species. It's probably not helping the species. The, the, the population is going to reach what the, what the amount of food that's there to support it, whether you hunt or not, particularly where you're mostly doing um, antler hunting. So antlers, you know, males are not my, my, monogamous. So it doesn't matter how many male deer you shoot, it doesn't have much of an effect on the population. Um, so we're, so hunting, but so we're not doing it either. It's not neither good nor bad for the populations. And yes, we have a lot of demands. There are certainly people we hear at every public hearing that say, we're taxpayers too, or a lot of us are here. Every time you buy conservation land, we're losing hunting opportunities. We should allow hunting in every conservation area. What we're looking at is a very small minority of the properties, but allowing some opportunities. So we allow hunting currently at Rainbow Beach, and we sort of have to, because we manage that jointly with Department of Food and the wildlife people, whatever they're called, the fish and wildlife. Um, and in return for them managing our property, they want us to have the same rules as they have. But that area doesn't have very good public access. We allow hunting, but it's, it's hard to get there. Um, we allow bow hunting at Beaver Brook Conservation Area. Beaver Brook has a very large stream along the road, so it's virtually impossible, except sometimes in the dead of winter when everything's frozen, to get across that anyway. So almost by definition, users are always going to be low there. There is a snowmobile trail that crosses the middle of the property, as so we get some users who go through there, but they, it's pretty far from the road, so it's also probably going to be never a really high use area. The Mineral Hills one's different. Mineral Hills right now, so we have several different conservation areas that are called Mineral Hills Conservation Area. And it's sort of aspirational. We call them all the same thing because we anticipate we'll be tying them together. So the area off Chesterfield Road is low use. If we ever tie it together with Turkey Hill Road, it might potentially be high use. And there's nothing that would stop us from coming and revisiting it at that Are you point. Are talking about Roberts Hill? That no. The, the no, further west. If you go to the Roberts Hill Reservoir um, and south of that, so almost to the, the West Hampton town line, we have a conservation area. It doesn't really go anywhere. It's very overgrown and very tick-ridden. And so most people don't go there. But if we someday acquired some property that, goes, that would go south, that might change. And we've certainly changed. You know, the, the, it's the Conservation Commission who adopts the rules for hunting, and they do change the rules. They just allowed it recently um, at Beaver Brook, where they didn't allow it before. They just, with your blessing, banned it at a spot at Fitzgerald Lake where it didn't make sense. Um, so, yes. Uh, hang, hang on a second, Councilor, because Councilor Nash was next, and oh, I, so. yeah, yeah. So, okay. so um, this is all really exciting. That um, you know, over the next few months, the public can have a lot of effect on these things, and it, it's really cool to to you know during this presentation. I remember all those meetings. You know, we talked about access to the river for people to you know, canoe and kayak and, you know, and, and people to be able to, you know, more uh, gardening and we have that out in, uh, in Florence. So this is really quite cool. Um, you, you mentioned access to Rainbow Beach. Could that be considered as part of this, uh, particularly pedestrian access? Um, I, I know that there's a number of uh, people uh, in, in Ward 3 who'd be interested in seeing pedestrian or bike access to, to Rainbow Beach. Yeah, so I, of course, told you our successes. So let me tell you what our big failures. Um, but we're still working on it. <laughs> so um, I had this on the slide under uh, 
agriculture. So let me come back to this. You just see this in, in detail. The very last item here, this is our goal for the next seven years, is deal with security in the meadows, hours of public access, and you see this language, potentially a grand compromise. Mm -hmm. We've been unable to find this. So we know that we have a significant problem. The farmers are absolutely right. There are dogs that defecate in the fields, and the state rule, uh, federal rules have gotten much stricter, and so sometimes it makes their crops unusable if they have that. And we know that there are people who drive through the fields and do donuts um, and have had a significant amount of crop damage as a result of that. And so the farmers are understandably upset about that. And so there's some land where are not public roads, they don't allow anybody to use at all. And that, of course, makes people who want to walk down there unhappy. We also know there's some benefits of people using land because most of us are good and we're sort of our guardians and we watch things and we call the police. And so with Ag Commission support, We've, we had this conceptual grand compromise of how about these roads which are, the public is using but isn't technically allowed to use? How about maybe, maybe gating some of those roads um, not, you know, at night and open them to the public during the day so the farmers would be more permissive at public use in the time we're not having problems and be more protected at public use at night and we could solve some of those problems. So, Rainbow Beach comes up because that land is landlocked by four different property owners. They're worried that if they let us have access to Rainbow Beach, it's the camel's nose, the camel's nose in the tent, and suddenly the public will have access to these roads, and then suddenly will take off and there'll be problems. And so we think if we could solve this overall legitimate concern that farmers have about misuse, that we could solve that. But it's hard to separate it out as a little thing by itself. Well, it, it, I just want to say the people who are interested in having access are not interested in doing donuts out there, that they're, you know, mainly just, you know, want to go out and be able to spend the day at what I've heard is a really pretty site. I've never been there. Mm. And that, um, so I think there's, there's a lot of overlap in uh, interest there. Um, the last thing I wanted to add, you gave B credit for the Montview Conservation Area, and it re really belongs with my wife, Dora, who worked with Wayne to negotiate that. So, thank you. He has to go home tonight, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Council LaBarge. Um, Wayne, you just talked about um, Turkey Hill Road on the further end of it. Are you talking about allowing for hunters to go in and shoot? Not on Turkey Hill Road. That's not what I'm suggesting. So I'm way in the I'm, back. No, I'm suggesting way up on Chesterfield Road. Oh, okay. Um, but you know, so that's part of the conversation. So we know that, and I'm not a hunter, and so if anyone's hunters, I hope no one takes this as an insult. But we know that. I used to live in Vermont, so I dealt with rifle hunting. So there's more potential problems. So Massachusetts doesn't allow rifle hunting. So, you know, a bullet goes a lot further from rifle. But we know the people who walk back to, to land, you know, who carry their, their, their gun in a way that they not shoot and they get to a land where they're allowed to hunt, tend to be the good hunters and aren't causing their problems. And the people who don't want to leave the road, you know, who want to be five feet from the road because it's easy, you know, to hunt there tend to be the ones we have greater misuse problems. And so we do play with, are there ways to encourage the hunters who are wonderful citizens and who are doing a really good job and ways to discourage the yahoos who are the ones causing the problem. So hunters are exactly like every single other user group. Most of them are good and there's a few bad ones. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how do we encourage the good ones and discourage the bad ones. Because I remember the meetings we had on, um, what areas for hunting and so forth, and I had quite a bit of people. Yeah, absolutely. And on my ward. I'm sure you're going to hear the same thing this time again. I think it's a, that's why I think it's a legitimate issue. Um, and and what we got last time around is the open space plan said this is thing we should work on. We should think about what those areas are. And in the seven years, conservation commission did open one area up, the Beaver Brook area, but it's only one area. It's only bow hunting, so it certainly hasn't really. The hunting community doesn't really feel like it's met the needs out there. Um, and, and I'm going to come back to G. Peter, because it's an example, I think, of a, of a partnership that worked. When we first came before City Council to acquire that property, th this is eight years ago you were council at the time? I'm making up the time, I'm very good at remembering dates, but about eight years ago. There was a lot of concern from, pe from the people in the Jeep community about would we cut them off. And they have done an amazing job of, of managing their own, of stopping the bad yahoos of trying to control the use. They just recently did a cleanup and took three truckloads of trash out of there. Um, they approached us to say, we do have a few areas where people are leaving the, the, 
the trail where you're not causing damage and going into the woods. And they approached us to say, cool, we've got a fencing, not fencing, but signage to keep people on. And they've really sort of, the fact that they're a little bit nervous, frankly, about losing this franchise has been very successful. Um, and that's sort of, I think that's, that's our model we want to get. How do we get, you know, some user experience for different groups in a way that's, you know, this is one trail that's a quarter of a mile long and one conservation area. But how do we provide some of that opportunity in a way it doesn't ruin it, other people's user experience and particularly doesn't ruin the habitat? Uh, but so hunting will be exactly the same kind of issue. Um, Any other questions, comments? So, uh, it's worth noting, you know, my entire life living in this area, of course, the, the anomaly in Northampton is that, and we've commented on this, we're on the river, we're on the Connecticut River. <clears throat> and until recently, really didn't have much in the way of, of municipal public access. But even then, it's still, we have our back to the river, the, one of the greatest resources imaginable. And I don't know if there, if you guys consider this more in your meta vision on how to expand access to the river and use and recreational use of the river beyond the uh, Green River Parkway right now. Yeah, we we haven't had a lot of discussions, frankly. I mean, obviously, the Connecticut River Greenway is our, is our biggest success story that's out there. We've played with a little bit. We were doing an invasive clearance project on the older farmland we owned off Damon Road, the 16 acres off Damon Road to city owned. And we cleared about an acre of invasives that was just north of that. And our original vision was particularly for River Run. River Run's funny because it certainly fits that. River Run is literally 300 feet from the Connecticut River. And probably the kids who are under 16 know how to get there. And probably other people have never even seen the river. It's sort of hidden there. And so we looked at the invasive project thinking, maybe there's a great opportunity to open that up at least for River Run residents. Are there other ways to do that? So ours has been more sort of um, opportunity based. We don't know. We catch don't catch as catch can. Then. Yeah. I, it, because I mean, it really does seem rather strange, and in fact, actually, you know, the, the historic paintings representing Northampton, of course, the principal feature is the river. Um, it's it's what established this as a as a community, and so it, by and large, many people aren't even aware of the river unless they get stuck in traffic on the bridge, and and that, and that's a that's the extent of their river experience. We, we do have one thing in the multi-use trail plan section that we did seven years ago that requires work for partners so it hasn't gone anywhere. But the state, so it's a state rail trail on the east side of the railroad tracks and it's a city rail trail on the west side of the railroad tracks. The tunnel will right. marry them together. Um, so we played with coming off the state rail trail. Could you wind a little uh, spur down to the river and go underneath the Coolidge Bridge? There's actually a little spot you could walk through and come up to Riverbank Road and end at Riverbank Road, but sort of suddenly create an opportunity for people to go down there, bicycle in the meadows. It's still appealing. You know, it, it would really require most Ma Mass Dot and Department of Conservation and Recreation because it's their property. But at least that part's in the plan is sort of one small piece towards what you're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else thank you very much for your presentation thank Wayne I you. appreciate that our up to the consent agenda and that includes but does not include the minutes because we've already done that but the item 17.343 is to approve the poll petition for Elm Street at st. John's Church location uh, also item 17.363 is to approve a poll petition for the Arch Street location uh, item 17.366 is to approve appointments to various committees scheduled to be taken up by the Committee on City Services on sep why does it say this? On September 5th, it's already happened. Um, yeah, and I can actually give a report on that. Okay. That, well, I was going to ask that we take C and D out of the consent agenda after you read them. Okay. So all right. So the request, all right. Why don't, why don't, why don't we remove those now and then I'll, I'll read them. Wait and read them later. Okay. So, okay. Okay, so item 17, uh, C and D on your agenda, item 17366 and 17371 will deal with out of the consent agenda. Also, item 17385 is to refer appointments to the Whiting uh, Street Fund Committee to the Committee on City Services. And the Whiting Street Fund Committee is uh, Joseph Mesterko, three, <coughs> 312 Chesterfield Road in Leeds. The term starts July 2017, expires June 2020. Andrea Murray of 54 Day Avenue in Northampton, the term to start July 2017, expiring June 2020. Michael Shaughnessy of 575 Bridge Road, 11-5 <coughs> 
in Florence. Uh, the term to start July 2017, expiring June 2020. Michael Quinlan of 712 Bridge Road in Florence. Term to start July 2017, expiring June 2019. And then Marilyn Richards of 20 Bridge Road, number 8 in Florence. Term to start July 2017, expiring June 2018. Um, so, and that's for referral. So, uh, I'll accept a motion on the consent agenda. And seconded. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Back to the items that were called out. Um, what did I just do with it? Oh, wait a minute. Holy cats. I missed, um, I did miss one item. And I missed item 17371. That's the one that you want to refer to. Yeah, well, I, uh, well okay. what I can do is I can report on the result of the referral to the okay, let me, fifth meeting. I'll read those and then uh, we'll refer to you. So item 17.366 is to approve the appointments to various committees. On the Arts Council, Melissa Lewis Gentry of 292 and a half South Street in Northampton. This is a term to start August 2017, expiring June 2020. This is a new appointment filling the expired term of Eric Olson. Uh, the Board of Registrars, uh, Daniel Polachek of 95 Jackson <coughs> Street in Northampton, the term to start August 2017, expiring June 2020. And this is a new appointment filling the expired term of uh, Sandra Hallowell. Uh, and then the planning board, Alan Verson of 508 Kennedy Road in Leeds, the term to start March 2015, expiring June 2018. That's a reappointment. And then also item 17.371, this is to approve the appointment of Martha Lyon as a historical commission <coughs> representative to the Community Preservation Committee. And um, so. Move approval of both those items. Second. Okay. And as to discussion. So what I can do is, oh, well, I'll just report that we did have a positive recommendation um, from the Committee on City Services for the uh, appointment to the Arts Council of Melissa Lewis Gentry and Board of Registrars, uh, Daniel Polacek. And I was going to refer to Councillor O'Donnell, um, who spoke with Alan Burson, if that's, but that was a neutral recommendation from the committee. Um, I would like to uh, ask for uh, the removal of, of Mr. Burson so we can vote on him separately from these okay. other appointments, if that's okay. okay. Sure. I, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. So, so, so far, so we have Melissa Lewis Gentry uh, for the Arts Council and Daniel Polachek for the registrars. Um, so. And, uh, and then I'll say that the uh, appointment of Martha Lyon also received a positive recommendation from the committee. Yes. Okay. So those two items taken as a group with the, with, uh, the one candidate um, pulled out separately for further discussion. Uh, so that's item 17366 and item 17371. Um, let's see, all those in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, now to uh, Mr. Verson's fi uh, uh, appointment discussion. Councilor O'Donnell, did you want to speak to the neutral recommendation? Need a, a motion on this yes, please. Yeah, w would you offer one? I'd, 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 I'd uh, move approval of appointment of Alan Verson to planning board. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Now to the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about this appointment separately because um, I'm actually not um, inclined to favor this appointment. And I wanted to explain uh, my vote um, <coughs> to, to my colleagues. Um, first, I'll say a word on the, the process. It's always a little awkward although it doesn't happen frequently that the council will turn down or even consider turning down appointments. <coughs> but that's because of our charter and the mayor makes appointments and the council um, vets them. So I want to say up front that um, with regards to um, this appointee, I think it's someone who has served uh, intelligently and thoughtfully actually on the planning board. And I'd like to describe uh, what I think are important philosophical differences that cause me to um, to, will cause me to vote uh, in the negative on this one. Um, it's hard to gauge how to evaluate members of the planning board, or it could be a little tricky, because like on the city council, 
frankly, most of the votes are unanimous. And in this case, um, we're talking about an associate member. And because of the, the state law, state laws that establish the planning board, associate members vote on permits, but there are some things that they don't vote on, although they participate in discussion. So if you want to do an evaluation, I think you have to go to the statements that have been made and the philosophies that you interpret from those statements. Um, I actually voted in favor of this appointee when he was first appointed um, in 2014, and it was in the Ordinance Committee, as we called it back then. Um, and <laughs> subsequently, the same year, through ordinance, through joint committee meetings uh, with the Planning Board, we tackled what actually to me was the, probably the most important thing I feel like I've participated in on the City Council, which were the revisions to the ordinance about zoning um, for seven or more units in the urban residential districts, um, B and C. And I remember, actually, that I wasn't the only one who followed Councilor Shara and I hosted a forum um, for uh, residents of the Fort Hill Lyman area. Because it, and actually, Councilor Nash was there as well, though he wasn't a councilor back then. He was uh, already very involved in zoning. And people came to the meeting and they, they expressed how uh, concerned they were about the zoning changes. And there was, there was so much discussion, actually, we delayed the, the vote on it and extended the deadline to act on it at least once. But out of that meeting and out of the, con out of the concerns I heard from people I represent, um, I brought forward jointly with uh, Councilor Shara um, a number of amendments to what the planning department had recommended for the zoning. And the three principal ones that I would like to highlight uh, had to do with park and civic space requirements for when you build something of seven or more units, affordability standards, and environmental and energy standards. And I was very, actually very proud of the work that the council did getting into the details of zoning. There was a, a joint ordinance and planning board meeting where we hashed out all these details, probably to most people the most boring thing uh, in the world. But in fact, zoning is um, essentially, essentially important uh, to the city. And I'd like to just review some of the statements that I recall Mr. Verson um, providing. And I, I, I checked the minutes in the video um, to confirm them. And there, I'll just mention two, just briefly. Um, one had to do with park space. We had a requirement that there be more park space, so it's not just concrete. Um, and the quote from this appointee was, um, I sense the language is drafted. It says it has to be desirable for residents of the project. <coughs> In other words, the park space requirement. It's not clear to me. I can't understand why a city zoning ordinance should require that residents that buy or rent into a development have to be happy? Why is it our job to protect the people who voluntarily choose to live there? It's important because <coughs> the free market doesn't necessarily deliver pristine, re we just talk about pristine, pristine results all the time. Uh, of course, people have a choice, but it's incumbent upon the city, in my opinion, to set certain standards so that what we build is in the public interest and protects those uh, who need it. So it's a philosophical question. <coughs> and to that philosophy, there was uh, a second quote, I'll just give you briefly, about energy, <coughs> energy standards. We, we wanted to require that there be stricter, stronger uh, energy standards in zoning. And that quote is, I have reservations about having a requirement for home energy standards. I think it's great to have high energy standards, but to impose it as part of zoning, which to me, my mind, my understanding has to do with structures and density, uh, and sort of paraphrasing, and now the quote again, uh, and location relative to other structures, I don't know why that's part of the zoning. Um, so what I'd like to, what I, what I observed at that time and what kind of bothered me ever since was that I think zoning is not just about uh, setbacks and dimensions and look I think there are certain principles that go into it and energy standards are certainly one that are very important um, in addition to affordability standards in addition to
park space and other things. And I don't want to misrepresent the appointees' quotes, but they are there for anyone um, to read. I think that when we appoint people to the planning board, it's our responsibility to, to make the best judgment we can about who we're putting on there. And indeed, if, if I understand correctly, as an associate member, this appointee didn't vote on the ordinance. He wouldn't have been able to, um, I, I believe. Um, but the ordinance passed unanimously. But as we all know, the city council knows, a lot of things passed unanimously. But what happens before the vote is very important. Amendments, discussion, the planning board especially, the conditions that are put on projects, the discussions and, and questions that are raised ultimately affect uh, specific projects and overall zoning policy. So that is my reason for, for not favoring it. Again, coming back to where I started, I, I very a uh, huge amount of respect for anyone who serves on the planning board, this appointee as well. Um, but it's important that we get the right people on the planning board. It's not a minor uh, board in my judgment. So that's my explanation. Any other comments or discussions, uh, Councilor Murphy? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many of you personally know Mr. Burson. He has been an attorney who's practiced here for over 40 years and has actually developed a lot of properties in Northampton. So he has a familiarity with the development side of interfacing with both the building department and the planning department and also an attorney's insights. And again, I didn't know this objection was coming up tonight, but also an attorney's insight and understanding of exactly what regulation covers what. Um, the energy efficiency of buildings is very well covered in the building code. We've adopted the stretch code here. Uh, those sort of things, the energy efficiency of a building belongs in a building code, not in zoning. Um, and I, I think he would feel pretty strongly about that. Um, a, a, and uh, th to the extent that we want to regulate the, the marketplace, um, you know, developers try and create environments and properties are going to want to draw people in so they purchase them. Developing something that has no appeal in the marketplace results in a failure. Um, we can overregulate things, and I think both as an attorney and a, and, and a, a developer, uh, Mr. Verson is very has a very good understanding of where perhaps we would cross the line in overregulating something. You know, the marketplace has something to say about providing something for everyone, and and things that work get bought, and things that don't don't. You know, he is. You know, I, I, I'm concerned that he might not share your opinions. But his opinions are valuable. He has a lot of insight, and and removing him from a board for which he's eminently qualified because we don't agree with some of his opinions is the wrong reason to do that. I mean, if he's if he's abusive to the public, if he's disruptive to the committee, um, if he doesn't respect the process, you remove him. But just because we don't agree with his opinions when he's intelligent, well versed, participates, and is you know and is is a team player doesn't seem necessarily right to me. Uh, Councillor Carney, then Councillor Bidwell. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, just um, a little context. The reason that we took these out of the consent agenda and spoke about them was that we had our meeting really only on Monday. Um, and unfortunately, Councillor O'Donnell wasn't able to be there. And so we're just hearing now that there are concerns about this appointee. Um, I don't know, I mean, ordinarily, and it's not as though we rubber stamp, but I think if there are concerns, we would typically try to give, or at least report on a conversation with the, with the person who's been recommended by the mayor and who has served on the board um, since 2014. So I don't know if that happened, and I certainly don't see Mr. Verson here or know if he's here or has an opportunity, or, you know, we've had any you know, real chance, or even to hear from the mayor. I'm not sure. If the, oh, the mayor is still here. So um, I'm interested in hearing more of that before, as uh, Councilor Murphy said, I'd be prepared to remove a person from who's been serving on the on the planning board. And again, I'll defer to ask that question to Councilor O'Donnell about the conversation with Mr. Burson if he's had that. Certainly. Um, well, some appointments require you know, phone conversations and interviews. And in fact, I remember 
in 2014, it was the first time I appointed anybody. And so um, in, in, what was it called, Rao rules, orders, appointments, and something. What we now know is legislative matters, although the function has shifted to city services. I actually insisted that we bring everyone in person to the committee, and they were somewhat uh, um, you know, like, why are we being summoned to this committee? And so our practice has been, you know, phone conversations make more sense. Um, new appointments, I think, require, you know, that kind of interview. When reappointments, I think, require evaluation. And I, you know, didn't call up and say, please defend yourself against my, my concerns. I didn't want to frame it that way. I wanted to interpret someone's actual uh, actions and record. And that's what I'm doing. Um, also having participated in a, a joint meeting on a major zoning revision um, with, the, with the appointee in question, uh, upon which I, I base my recommendation. Councilman Bidwell. Um, uh, for, for the record, I, 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 I know uh, uh, Attorney Verson slightly, but not at all well. That's, that's neither here nor there. Um, I would need to know more about the, the context and the overall flavor rather than taking, taking, taking quotes from minutes uh, uh, like that to, to form an opinion. And it might very well be that, that I might share some reservations uh, as well with, with those opinions, but I don't really, I don't really think that's what's, what's important here. I, I think that uh, zoning and the work of the planning board is incredibly complicated. And it lends itself to a variety of opinions, and I think uh, it's healthy to have a variety of opinions represented on, on planning board. Indeed, uh, a number of our civic bodies, including this one, are sometimes accused of being too susceptible to groupthink. Um, uh, so I, I, I think it's 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 appropriate that uh, that there be. Um, uh, alternative views uh, represented in this complicated world of zoning and planning and and so I would uh, with all due respect to Councillor O'Donnell I would be uh, inclined to be supportive of this appointment. Councillor Sherrill and Councillor Labarge. Um, can I just ask for a clarification? Did I hear that there, I understand that Councillor O'Donnell wasn't there for the meeting, but did I hear that it was a neutral recommendation that came out of the committee? I'll, I'll clarify, yeah. Um, we, we figured we would go ahead and send a neutral recommendation in deference to Councillor O'Donnell's not being there and being able to report on his evaluation. Okay, so that, that had a new, only Mr. Verson had a neutral recommendation. Right, everything because, else was a positive recommendation. Um, because he had been assigned. Only because it was neutral, only because we had heard right. no report. Okay, Councillor Barge. Yes, um, I'd like to make a motion um, that we recognize the mayor. I would like him we to speak. You don't need to make a motion. You can't. You don't. So, the, Your Honor, did you want to? You want to speak to this, or were you? I mean, I can. Um, I can certainly. Uh, so, when I look at, at boards, uh, one of the things I've tried to do when I look at boards and commissions um, is I I look at a number of factors. I look at I try to look for um, geographical balance, you know, people who live in different parts of the city, I do try to look at, um, you know, we try to encourage diversity and on, on commission, committees and boards. Um, but I will say that for boards like this, this one, I also have strived to try to find some diverse opinions. Um, probably Mr. Verson and I would probably not agree uh, a lot on some land use planning principles and um, and some philosophies and things like that. And that's actually, I, I wanted somebody who brought um, a developer legal background to the planning board. And that was a deliberate, um, you know, when we were looking, when I was looking to fill some positions, um, we, you know, have some great people on the planning board and people who have planning experience and people who work in the field of planning. Um, but I also thought it was important to have some people who were, you know, someone like you know Mark Sullivan who builds things all day long you know works for the oldest con you know business in Northampton and is a multi-generational construction firm so also brings some practical experience um, and then you know someone like Alan Verson who um, is an attorney has worked in in um, the field but has also owns property has developed properties so that was by design that I chose him so um, 
So I guess I would be worried if, if uh, well, certainly the council, the charter, you know, you have absolute uh, power to reject any of my nominees, certainly. Um, I guess I would just be, I'd be concerned if somebody who served, you know, since 2014 would be rejected because of, you know, two things they said. Um, that would just be a concern. When we do have a reappointment, we talk to staff, we do look at their attendance record. Um, you know, and, and again, somebody who's an associate uh, versus somebody who is a, a full member, there's also a, a difference there. Um, but I felt comfortable uh, putting forward the reappointment of Mr. Mr. Verson. And again, um, do I agree with all of my appointees? Um, no, uh, not necessarily. But what I'm looking for is, in many cases, you know, some <coughs> diversity of opinion, particularly on a board like the planning board, because as Councillor O'Donnell said, this is a really important um, function uh, that we do. Land use planning really determines so many other uh, things that happen in the city. So having some diversity of opinion, I think, is good. So, so that was my rationale originally for putting Mr. Verson uh, on the planning board, and um, and it's why I feel comfortable reappointing him. So, um, Councillor Down, do you want to speak to that, or uh, uh, Councillor Klein? Do you? Uh, well, you haven't spoken. So do you want to speak in response to that? Oh, I like going back and forth. I'll respond subsequently. Okay, uh, Councilor Klein. So I feel like I'm starting to hear your kind of um, dialectic around politics and philosophies versus um, kind of capability, as it were. And it's interesting, especially in these times when we have someone like President Trump. <laughs> appointing someone like Jeff Sessions to be the Attorney General, is he qualified? Is he, does he have a legal background? Has he been involved in litigating cases? Yes, that, you know, on the surface of things makes him um, eligible and perhaps appropriate for many people as Attorney General. Um, but we do make decisions based on politics and philosophies about these things. And I think that's a really important thing to do. And yes, diversity of opinion can be important. But when something like planning and zoning and things that really affect the quality of life in the city are at stake, and somebody is being appointed that has particular kinds of philosophies that don't think about kind of public good, public health, um, things that are impacted by zoning. Uh, I think it's absolutely relevant to take into account this person's politics and philosophies around how development happens. Um, so I appreciate the input from Councillor O'Donnell and uh, the thinking behind how he's presenting this. Uh, Councilor Down, did you want to respond to the mayor and then Councilor Murphy? I was, though, Councilor Klein sort of encapsulated what I want to say. I, I think perhaps we have to be careful not to go too far and to make it, again, like I said in the beginning of my comments, not to make it personal in any way. Um, everyone has different opinions. In fact, the mayor listed other members of the planning board who are also of experience being developers and attorneys and this kind of thing. So I wouldn't think that diversity of experience would go away. But the other important body besides the planning board is city council. This is the only chance we really have to influence the makeup of the planning board, which has broad uh, powers and implications for the city. It makes up more than the physical fabric of Northampton. It, it, we've encoded in our zoning law, especially during this revision process, other principles that are important as well. So that's the basis on which I'm going at it, not in terms of uh, a personal indictment, but rather the values that Councilor Klein uh, mentioned again. So. My concern is that Councilor Klein's opinion makes diversity a one-way street. You know, if, you, if, you, if we agree with you, it's okay. If we don't agree with you, your opinion is somewhat less valid. You know, as the mayor said, we, he tries to get diversity. He tries to get different points of view. I mean, as I recall, the, the meeting you're talking about, I chaired, so I was at that meeting. And we made the most substantial changes in zoning since the 70s when zoning happened. It was, you know, for somebody that you know, has dealt with the zoning ordinance since the 70s, it was astounding how we came to consensus and made changes that were, you know, were amazing based on, I mean, 
Mr. Fiden is smiling back there, but I remember councils <laughs> in the 80s and the 90s where he never would have dreamed to attempt to make those kinds of changes given the demeanor of this body, and it was just astounding to me how successful those were. And I don't recall anybody, you know, having any ideas that were out of line there. Um, you know, and I think it's important that somebody like Mr. Verson, who's knowledgeable, who participates, who clearly um, the chair, the staff member of that committee, would have agreed to their reappointment and given them a positive recommendation just because some of us don't philosophically agree with, with where they're coming from that we should stifle them and knock them off a committee for that if they're participating and, uh, and they're not disruptive just because we don't agree with their points of view. Councilor Nash. Yeah, um, so um, my thoughts on this is that um, this discussion sh really should have happened committee. in committee and that um, and that um, that the recommendation should have come forward and um, you know it should have happened there you know it, it's I do employment work it's important that you do things in the right steps that there's the initial interviews that and things get increasingly more, increasingly more important and we've brought Mr. Verson to this point in this public forum where he you know we're on TV and everything and that um, and I think that um, we, we missed the boat there and um, I don't know how to put it back in the box because we were having the discussion here um, and um, I, I think based on that um, that I I, you know, I, I'm, he's made it this far. And that, um, and I've heard, um, uh, Mr. Verson, I've heard some of his comments in planning board, and sometimes they, they are counter to what's going on. And I kind of appreciate that, that, um, that, uh, that uh, the, it, it, it prompts further discussion and, um, and, and a move away from, um, I, I'm, I don't want to say group think is going on, but that um, it, it's good to have somebody who's just going to throw some thoughts in there that'll um, change the d discussion a little. But, but I, I, you know, I, I think this should have been hap this should have happened at committee. So. Councilor Carney and then Councilor. Well, just Ford. as uh, committee chair, <laughs> I, I would, you know, it was unfortunate that we just didn't know that that there was a concern, and there typically, I mean. Typically, we have had we either we know a person or can report. And I, I would, I mean, my concern tonight is that um, Mr. Verson would find out that he may not be appointed in the in the paper or something, which is as <laughs> reported right here. And it just seems people who are these are volunteers who serve on our committees, and I think that they ought to have the opportunity if there is a concern to come to the subcommittee meeting and speak to the other members of the committee if we, that's typically what what we do we haven't we haven't ordinarily had us uh, and this is with full appreciation of the councilor o'donnell's concerns but this is not the place to do that we haven't given mr person the opportunity to address some of those concerns and as chair of the committee i just w would we, we sent forward a neutral recommendation, and my sense is just because where we're at, I'm, I'm inclined to um, uh, favor the appointment. <clears throat> uh, Council O'Donnell, you want to respond to that, and then Council LaBarge. If I may just, yeah, I think those are, I can understand that, that viewpoint. Um, I want to say respectfully of that viewpoint, I think there's a sense that this is a, an earthquake, but it's, I see it as more of a tremor. I mean, voting no on an appointment that the mayor puts forward is not, is not a bad thing, necessarily. It's just exercising our judgment. And I, w I would say with regards to the process, uh, hearing the opinions of my colleagues, which I respect, I would have had to explain my position anyway in full city council because I would have nonetheless voted no. Um, so I think that's <coughs> an important point. I don't think it changes the fundamental issues. It's a responsibility of the council to make decisions on appointments, and that's all this discussion is it's not anything more so I've just explained my vote and people vote differently then certainly understand that Council Bart. yes um, I know um, attorney writes him very well and he was on a committee with us which had to do with the landfill we all had different opinions 
and I think that's what made our committee work very, very well. Um, I think it's a great diversity that we have on the planning board. We've had artists on the planning board too. It's a learning experience for no matter who goes on the planning board, and the mayor is absolutely correct. I mean, he is an attorney. He does know about um, zoning. He knows about the laws. We've had many attorneys on planning. And I, I, I'm just so uncomfortable tonight because I, I just feel this is unfair. I've, it's too bad that we had not known that there could have been a problem with some form of communication and ask Alan to come in to our meeting so that we could talk with him. I'm going to support this appointment 100% because he does have a right to his opinions and I don't have a right as a counselor if I was on the planning board and somebody said, well, you know, she disagreed with this or about the zoning, about the setbacks or whatever. That's what the planning is all about. You have your opinions and you got to be very, very knowledgeable. You should have registered land surveyors on it. You should have a lot of educated engineers on the planning board and attorneys. Um, I'm going to jump in here. The um, I think all the points have been made in some respect. I think the um, actually this conversation is illustrative of, of the value of diversity when conflicting opinions, because actually with conflicting opinions actually prompts people who maybe feel fairly confident in, in their perspective and, and, and vote, it, may, it will stimulate them to justify it. Um, now, I don't include Mr. Verson in my fan base. I understand he's, he's not particularly <laughs> fond of the way I conduct polity. Um, but actually, to the mayor's point, uh, I think it's appropriate because I think the snow globe needs to be shaken in order to make the system work in a higher functioning way. And I think predominantly, you know, and I think, again, a good illustration of, of a s successful outcome is what Councilor Murphy refers to, is that that zoning, despite, despite the objections that were heard that were prompted, actually passed uh, uh, with consensus. And uh, was, that was a pretty high hurdle. And it was uh, the pushback the way the pushback is done, I would agree. Uh, the, and in fact, actually, some of the other comments that I've heard in some other meetings have um, rubbed me the wrong way, I'll say. That said, uh, no meeting is exclusive of that. There have been a number of them that, that have done that. There have been a number of um, uh, colleagues that have mm -hmm. had some discussions that have, I felt, were not philosophically uh, adept, basically, or at least can formed with my sense of philosophy. But I don't think, I mean, I think Councilor O'Donnell is absolutely correct. We're trying to, in, in the regards that we're trying to um, have a committee that reflects the principles and, and ideals that we want to advance that are laid out in our visioning process, all the, 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 all the time that we've dedicated to these um, particular ideas. That said, you need uh, another bad metaphor, but uh, a pearl is made because of the irritant, <laughs> and that the irritant actually provokes a response to that that actually creates something that's greater than the original process. The Jeff Sessions analogy, I understand the point, but I don't think it's appropriate because the authority that we're talking about here is vastly different. He's not presiding over any agency or anything that actually uh, he is a participant in a consensus group that um, is far different than Jeff Sessions. And I, I also, I hold your um, opinion about what, and concerns relative to that particular appointment. Um, this appointment is different. This is an advisory board that also, and in fact, particularly an associate position, mm -hmm. is not much more than that. It's not, it's, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't command as much authority or impact on the vote, other than challenging people at times when it may or may not be appropriate, but the fact is the challenge part actually is a significant part and a valuable part of the process. Um, so to that 
degree, yes, and you wanted to respond to that. I was just going to say, to, to that degree, if just it, it holds for me, I, I need a higher bar for um, rejecting a, a, a nominee or an appointee <coughs> because I, I mean, we've had many that on other departments and other programs and other uh, that I've strongly disagreed with uh, personally and, and, and politically. And I will vote. I have voted in favor of them uh, simply because I think that mix is appropriate and, and important. And you, um, sure. I mean, I would just say that uh, diversity of opinion is important, and so I'm I'm perplexed at the portrayal of what would probably be the on, the council's only no vote on any appointment as somehow inappropriate. I, I sense that I'm in the minority, but I think, as the council president pointed out, with regards to the planning board, it's certainly okay with regards to the city council. It's okay to have this debate. I firmly believe that we need to scrutinize the people we appoint, and, 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 and that's what I'm doing. Absolutely, um, and that was my point also. Uh, this discussion was a lot better than that. I think that the value of this is we're discussing <coughs> and the reason for the, and the conflict yeah. is has as much value as whatever the outcome of the vote is. And the other thing, when, when we critique uh, comparisons and similes, I also don't think the comparison to, to clams is relevant. <laughs> necessarily <laughs> oysters, 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 please. please. This is an irritant. It's gotta get our eyeballs <laughs> right. <laughs> this is how little I know about your metaphor. <laughs> but, so let me reassert, you know, uh, it's ideology matters, values matter. The issues I pointed out that deserve to be in zoning are important. Uh, we just heard a, uh, an hour-long presentation about how we've transformed some of our values in Northampton into a, uh, uh, a citywide success with conservation and, and other things. These are important things to put into zoning. Uh, so that's the basis of my explanation. For no, I, and I, I hear so you loud and clear. Others' opinions as well. No, I, and I know you do. And, I, and the, my only point that I would make is that um, the vision and the, and the accomplishments that have been described have come as a result of those debates and discussions that have been more heated and more emphatically and probably more crudely uh, than, than Mr. Versons ever expressed. And, and that there, that we, we need that pushback, basically. I won't say the irritant. At least that, <laughs> that and I, I agree with you. And I actually, I'm glad that you challenged an appointee. And in, in my memory, we have challenged some appointees for some Way back. rally, not particularly strong reasons. They were trying to be personal, mm -hmm. personal conflicts with some counselors who went and and I had a real problem with that. Mm -hmm. I know that's not the case here. This is not a personal conflict. This is actually a genuine philosophical conflict. And um, and my only point is, despite having people with philosophical differences on these uh, as appointees, we still have made significant progressive change. And uh, I suspect we will continue to do so. Uh, Council Murphy's been waiting, and then, then mm -hmm. Council Carney. Mm -hmm. Having been myself uh, subject to one of the most interesting appointments, I think you were on the council when that yes. occurred. Uh, yes. it was, in fact, that resulted in the uh, Committee on Appointments, I think, that, that That's exciting television experience. Uh, but in, in this sense, you know, it's interesting, because we, we value diversity here. And given the general tenor of the uh, of the planning board, Alan is the diversity. You know, he is he's the thing that doesn't always fit. He is diversity, and the fact and the fact that we would cleanse him for that very reason seems very unlike something that we would do in this body. You know, he's he's a different opinion, but he's knowledgeable. He has experience. He participates well. He maybe he doesn't say what we always want to hear. But as the mayor said, that's why he's there. And he's respectful and he participates and maybe we don't always like to hear what he has to say, but it's a voice, in this case it is diversity, that should be heard. And, and unless he's disruptive and, in, and unless he is not acting as a team player, it, it would seem out of place to <coughs> urge him for that reason. Um, <clears throat> I would just say that uh, to Councilor Donald's point, I, I don't have objections to the um, objecting to an appointment. I'm a little more concerned about the process because, uh, you know, as was brought up, the reason that we have this in committee is we're a couple of things. 
One being, I think, um, giving the prospective appointee or reappointee the opportunity to speak to the committee. And uh, that rarely happens because in our phone conversations or whatever, we may have said, you don't have to come because I'm going to put your name forward as a positive recommendation or, or whatever. I mean, there's process there. But in this case, there would be no, I'm, and I don't mean to say it like it, but I do see the report. They have to be finding out about it, reading it in the paper. And I just feel like just as a matter of process, that's not something. If we didn't give him the opportunity to come even tonight with the heads up that there's a concern about your appointment, um, <clears throat> certainly to our own committee. And so that's the that's one reason that I, that's the one concern I have about us. Um, yes. Because, it, you know, finding out the next day is not great. Does anyone have new points to bring to this particular discussion? No. I just wanted to move a hold on you quick. And I second yeah. that one. All right. Yes. Roll call? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, roll call, yes. Uh, Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? No. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? No. Councillor Shaw? Yes. Okay. The, the appointment is approved with a majority vote. So next up, we've got halfway through the agenda, uh, we're going to recess for finance. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> Council Murphy will be presiding. So then I have to say, John, would you call the roll of finance? I will. Councilor Murphy. I'm here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor LaBarge. Present. Councilor Nash. Here. Excellent. Uh, first item is to approve the minutes of our August 17th me meeting. Do we have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor Great. Mayor and we have some uh, financial orders tonight. Oh. Uh, the first one is upon the recommendation of the mayor at 17.384 to accept a gift of a parklet from the owner of the roundhouse, whereas the open space recreation multi-use plan recommends a pavement to parks program preserving small previously urbanized or paved areas as tiny parks or parklets and whereas since the adoption of the pavement to parks policy the city working with the community members has completed three pavement to park projects Amber Lane Pleasant Street Hockenham Road and a mobile downtown parklet and whereas the owner of the roundhouse has offered to develop a new parklet on the rear of the roundhouse uh, city property and whereas the city has received a request for development of a 200 square foot more or less public parklet with handicapped ramp which would serve the parklet and abutting business in an unused area off Amber Lane that is not needed by Central Services or DPW. Now therefore it be resolved that the City Council authorizes the Mayor to accept the donation of the Roundhouse Parklet in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 44 Section 53 A and a half in a matter uh, to ensure unfettered public access to the parklet to reserve the right of the city to approve the final design and to include other such terms and conditions as the mayor finds reasonable. Do we have a motion? I make a motion. Second. Um, I, I was going to have Mr. Fyden talk to you about this. There is a Scrivener's error in the final whereas. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I believe it refers to um, Amber Lane. Right. I was going to um, say. That's uh, true. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Amber Lane. Um, I think that should say what we're thinking behind the roundhouse. Uh, that's the verbiage. You can give them the verbiage. Yeah. So, yeah, there was a there was a parklet cut and paste error or something. <laughs> Whatever. So sorry. So yes. Is it parklet language? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sorry. You caught me using the model from Amber Lane over here. <laughs> um, so some of you know the historic was actually a road behind the roundhouse which the city still keeps and we still have uh, infrastructure, a storm sewer that goes underneath there, maybe sanitary sewer that goes underneath there. Um, so Roundhouse used to have a sort of a, a, a deck behind the Roundhouse that was actually on city property. They took it down because it needed some work, <coughs> came back to us and said they'd like to do some work and bring it back as a little park. It's primarily going to serve people in their building, which is why they're happy to volunteer this, but it is on public property. Um, our response was, um, that's subject to city council approval. We'd love the idea of people improving another parklet. We know that 90% of the users are going to be people in the building, but anyone else in the public would be welcome to use it. So they'd make the improvements, the improvements they want to make, um, and, and so it's very similar to the Amber Lane project. 
Just a question. If we were to just say uh, in an unused area that is not needed by central services and DPW and just remove reference to Amber Lane, would that be sufficient? That would be sufficient. Would be yes. sufficient. But the yeah. other thing you should make, as I'm catching my errors, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I apologize for this, is the 200 square feet, the number is also from Amber Lane. It's actually a bigger site. So if you could just strike the square footage. It's a, it's a small area. I don't know exactly what it is size-wise. And I, again, apologize for that. I'll move those uh, two changes. Okay, yes. so we go. Second. All right. So just development of a parklet. So strike the reference to the size and location. <coughs> right. A floating parklet near the roundhouse. Excellent. Uh, all in favor of the, of the amendments, please say aye. Aye. No question. Uh, yes. Um, so is this a, it's a deck or a park? It's a park. He's going to do a staircase. So he has a little deck behind his building that's on yeah. his property. He's going to do a little staircase up to that, but the rest of it is a park. So it's, you know, basically paving stones and greenery. Okay. Out there. Right. So it's going to look like it's open to the public. That's right. So one of our conditions for this is there is a gate right now, which is always closed and says private. Right. Um, that, that gate will be open and the private sign will come down. Okay. Just does the deck stay or? The deck is sort of, a very small thing right along his property. That will stay. Okay. It's not taking anything down. Any other questions from anyone for Mr. Feynman? All right. So then as amended, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Didn't, didn't get the vote on the we, were we interrupted on the yeah, vote? I thought we voted. No. no. no we were about to, to vote. vote. Yeah, and then I, I, <coughs> I, all in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 All in favor of the uh, positive recommendation as amended? Aye. Aye. Good. <laughs> Again, upon the recommendation of the mayor, this is 17.386. This is an order to approve expenditure of up to $5,000 per year in gift funds, whereas the Northampton Parks and Rec Department receives numerous small monetary contributions each year, and whereas it's in the best interest of the Northampton Parks and Recreation Department in the city to streamline the process by which small monetary gifts up to a certain value may be used to purchase supplies and services for the Parks and Recreation Department and community. Therefore, order that in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, uh, the Council approves the expenditure of up to $5,000 per year in gift funds from the Parks and Recreation General Gift Account for equipment and services needed by Northampton Parks and Recreation Department to fulfill their mission. Do we have a motion, Finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. And the Mayor is here to speak on this one. Yeah, um, this is basically uh, uh, Director uh, Mogio um, frequently will get people wanting to, you know, say I'd like to buy a new bag of kickballs or I'd like to, you know, donate for so that you could buy some, you know, new cones for Safety Village, whatever it is, just small, like somebody wants to give them a $90 check or a $100 check. Um, and I think the, the idea then if they want to go purchase those, then they'll need to come to the city council to get an appropriation to spend the hundred dollars on the bag of kickballs or the whatever so um, obviously if the if the um, if, if parks and rec receives a huge gift they're gonna come forward so this is a, you know setting a five thousand dollar limit on the expenditure of gift funds and just gives them a pre-authorization um, and that's in a year so you know they they can't go over five thousand dollars with all you know combination of gifts here there and everywhere cannot exceed five thousand dollars in the year or you know they have to come to council uh me and the council for approval so so it's so like far. streamlining it exactly that's the whole idea um and again you know they're they're the kind of department where they tend to get these kinds of gifts. Not every department gets these kinds of gifts. You know, similarly, you know, well, there's another order coming forward that's for real property. Um, that's more like some of the ones you've approved recently for like the police department, mm -hmm. you know, where somebody wants to donate stuffed toys to our animal control officer um, so that she can have them for, for stray dogs uh, or sometimes teddy bears for kids. Um, the idea that we don't have to come to city council to accept that real property if it has a certain value so similar principle and there's actually the next order is going to do just that as well for uh for parks and rec for people who want to actually give the kickballs as opposed to money to buy the kickballs or whatever whatever it is so any other questions for the mayor on this one pretty straightforward 
All in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the next one is 17387 to approve the acceptance of gifts of tangible personal property, very similar, 5,000 or less. Whereas Northampton Parks and Rec Department receives numerous gifts of tangible personal property each year, and whereas Mass General Law Section, or Chapter 44, Section 53A and a half provides that acceptance of gifts of tangible personal property requires a vote of the City Council and approval of the Mayor, and whereas it's in the best interest of the Parks and Recreation Department in the City to streamline the process by which gifts up to a certain value may be accepted and placed into service for the Parks and Recs Department. If the unity now therefore be ordered. The City Council hereby authorizes the Director of the Parks and Rec Department to accept gifts of tangible personal property with a fair market value of 5000 or less from the federal government, a charitable foundation, a private corporation or similar statutory entity, individual, or from the Commonwealth or any political subdivision thereof. The Director shall use such gifts for the restricted purpose provided by the donor or if no restriction is attached, to the gift for such other purposes as the director deems advisable. We have a motion. Make a motion. Second. Second. Um, real similar. Any questions I, on this one? I think I just explained it. So. No. Hearing none. All in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Uh, again, upon the recommendation of the mayor, this is 17388, in order to approve reprogramming funds totaling $17,361 to central services, order that $13,562.50 of the remaining balance in the fire alerting system project, that $2,064 of the remaining balance in the building inspection vehicle project. Uh, that $1,734.50 of the anticipated remaining balance in the Forbes Library fire and smoke alarm update project be reprogrammed to provide a total of $17,361 to the Central Services Department for the evaluation, removal, uh, cabling, and stump grinding of trees on the grounds of the Forbes Library. Do we have a motion, Finance? Motion. Second. Second. Uh, second. Okay. So um, uh, the city has been working uh, very closely with uh, uh, Director Lisa Downing at Forbes Library to do an assessment of their trees. Um, and they actually have two kinds of trees. Well, they have their own trees that are on their property. Um, and then there are, are uh, city-owned shade trees uh, on the property. Um, and sadly, there's some serious issues with both the shade trees, which you may have seen a recent editorial by the chair of the uh, of the Public Shade Tree Commission um, that the, the uh, tree warden has recommended uh, several of them have to come down because they're hazardous. Um, and similarly, at the back of the property, on, on their main property, there's a number of other similar vintage trees that are in a tough situation. Uh, Central Services, which oversees maintenance uh, for uh, the library, brought in a private um, arborist uh, to go through and give us an estimate on a combination of, in some cases, some removals, in other cases, some cape, some trimming and cabling, um, and has sort of given us a, f a full menu of what needs to happen. Um, this has been, um, the issue has sort of come to the f front for because, you know, Forbes has been hosting a lot of outdoor events, um, like the outdoor movies and things like that, and there have been concerns about limbs and things uh, falling from hazardous trees. So I, so there's, and just generally circulation around the building, cars and things like that. So, um, so this would basically reprogram some leftover funds from a series of uh, capital projects, including a Forbes project, uh, to allow central services to, to move forward. We think this is a critical item. We, want to, we don't want to wait until the capital improvement uh, program because there's a, a public safety issue now that we've identified that some of these are hazards. Mm -hmm. uh, questions for the mayor on this one? Everybody good with uh, fixing the trees? Very good. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the last one is, uh, again, upon the recommendation of the mayor, 17389, in order to authorize payment of prior year bills. This is from the Department of Public Works from their FY17 budget. The total amount we're, we're going to pay is $1,244.44. Um, three of them to the Southern Computer Warehouse for computer monitors. 
one for $101.83, one for $123.86, and one for $123.86. Seal Pro for Thoroughbrand mechanical, mechanical Packing, $377.50. Valley Motorsports per parts for a generator, $382.92. Foster Farrar for a broom and flag tape, $89.33. It's an additional <laughs> grid for water at the electric department for uh, $45.10. That total is $1,244.40. Do we have a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second? Second. Any di discussion on this one? Water? Yeah, it, so it was basically the water department um, receives multiple bills for, you know, its facilities and including some of its pumping stations, et cetera. So this was a bill uh, for a month or whatever it was that got sent to the wrong department. It ended up in the wrong department. And by the time it got rerouted back to DPW to be paid, the fiscal year had already lapsed. So that's, yeah. So that's why it's a, it's a, it's not our electric department. It's our water department's electric bill. Right. Not our electric department's water bill. Yeah, I think that was, that's that's, that's just, <laughs> we don't have an electric department. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's that's what struck me. That's what struck yeah. me. So it's a water department electric bill, one of the many that they have. So. Very good. Hearing no questions, all in favor of a positive aye. recommendation, please say aye. 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 And that is the end of our agenda. I think. So uh, I know of no new business, so a motion to adjourn finance would be in order. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Okay. So we come out of finance and reconvene. It's the full council. Uh, so we'll address those financial orders in order. Uh, item 17, well, actually not in the same order that they were presented there, but uh, item 17.386 is the order to approve the expenditure of up to $5,000 per year in gift Mr. First reading, motions made and seconded. Did you get those? No. Uh, it was Councilor O'Donnell and Councilor Shara. Um, any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LeBard. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Second reading will be at our next meeting. Item 17.387, this is an order to approve the acceptance of gifts of tangible personal, prop tangible personal property of $5,000 or less. Uh, also, first reading. Motion. Got it. Oh, got it. All right. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? John? Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. That's approved in first reading and will be revisited at our next meeting. Item 17.388 is in order to approve reprogramming funds totaling $17,361 to Central Second. Services. Second. Who made the uh, Council Councillor LaBarge? Okay. Uh, discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Joy? Yes. That passes in first reading. Item 17.389, this is an order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Discussion? Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. That passes in first reading as well. Item 17.373, this is an order authorizing the payment of a prior year bill. Move to approve. <coughs> Motion's made and seconded. Uh, discussion? I support paying your bills. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Noted. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Okay, now we come to a second meeting that's going to sound eerily familiar. Item 17.373 is an order authorizing the payment of a prior year bill. We just, we just did that. We just didn't did that. This is, this is the second no, meeting for so one that we approved oh, last, right. last meeting. Oh, oh. This okay. one's the. Different, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. Hence the confusion. 
Okay, so is there a motion? Check with the to yeah. Yeah. Check with I, the We just did vote John. on that. Three sub you did, three did vote it on. We, are, we did a previous year bill first, a first reading of the with the computer monitors and all those. With three eight nine now? John support paying bills twice. So we have item 17.389 was an order to authorize payment of prior year bill. Right, we did that one and we did you already three seven that three. Then you just did 373. Right. Okay, well, God forbid, I don't want to do that. But it's okay. All right, now we're up to item 17.374. Yes. This is an order to accept a donation of $4,000 for the purchase and installation of benches. This is a second reading. To approve. Second. second. Any discussion on the benches? Roll call, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Lebar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Okay. There's, uh, that passes in first reading. Uh, the city clerk is on our way. There's apparently uh, a second. There's a councilor outside. I mean, I was a councilor, a skunk, I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> What a slip. <laughs> wow. Uh, some of them some Freudian issues. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we're okay. It's going to come in. It's going to We're up to orders item 17.384. This is an order to accept a gift of a parklet from the owner of the roundhouse. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sharp. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. That passes in first reading. Uh, item 17.354, this is an order to endorse the Walk Bike Northampton Citywide Pedestrian and Bicycle Comprehensive Plan. Uh, second Move reading. Motions have been made. Seconded. Uh, Councilor Murphy? I do have, because I, I, I uh, abstained on this last time because I hadn't read it yet. And I have read it, so I wonder if I could ask Mr. Fiden a couple of questions about sure. it. Sure. I don't want to not, I don't want to, I want to be able to vote for it, but I have a couple questions. Um, one of the objectives is to reduce single occupancy vehicles. What sort of things would you do to do that? So the bike share program we talked about, um, it suddenly makes life a lot easier. So I, I live about uh, just over a mile from downtown. And you can imagine it becomes much easier for me to bicycle if I can do a bike share instead of driving. Um, so it's all, I mean, I think the key thing is all through incentives, not through disincentives. So how do we make it more desirable for people to walk and bicycle and carpool? Um, in the past, we've brought Zipcar to Northampton, working with Smith College. We're now bringing bike share, uh, the bike lanes, uh, the, the work on Elm Street that makes it more desirable for a walk. There's a number used in planning that most people walk a quarter of a mile before they drive, and many people walk four tenths of a mile, but it's actually not very accurate as to do with how much resistance there is. So the more desirable you walk, the further people will walk, the less desirable, the, the less they walk. Yeah. Um, then on ma the Main Street redesign, there's all sorts of things with uh, bike lanes and crosswalks and islands and bump outs and wider sidewalks and all of that and then minimizing any reduction in curbside parking. Do those two things, can those two things really happen together? Yes. I know the downtown business community loves their curbside parking. Oh, and they're to absolutely it, right. To it make it safer and, and, and more accessible, but not minimize people's access, because as we all know, they don't like to walk very far. Yes, I think it's absolutely critical. So um, there probably are gonna be a couple of parking spots lost right around streets where you need better line of sight. But yes, the idea is thinking, so what we worked carefully with Alta is thinking real estate downtown is really valuable. We can't do wider sidewalks and tree belts and bike lanes because we don't want to lose parking. So that, that becomes part of it, is, is mm -hmm. yeah, parking's really a critical part. Mm -hmm. And on Elm Street, you talk about um, changing the orientation of the parking so it buffers the bike lanes, so you'd parallel park and then have a gap for a bike lane in front of the, in the between the cars and the curb. Right. So if you look at the, the new bike lanes that we put in on Pleasant Street, mm -hmm. they're only 400 feet long. But that's what we did. The bike lanes are sidewalk, then bike lane, then park cars, mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of growing in popularity. Um, Elm Street, we've made some, or Smith College has made some investment in curb extensions. So we know if we were doing it over today, we would do Elm Street differently whether the benefits are worth ripping out some investment, that, that remains to be discussed. But. Mm -hmm. Would that 
to make them seasonally usable require because when we remove the snow from the street then it winds up in the bike lane would we be trying to clear them to permit your so own bike use or that becomes a philosophical question how we want to use resources but frank frankly we already have a problem right now on elm street when it gets plowed they're not picking up the snow so we lose about two feet of elm street so the cars park two feet out so we lose the bike path already so whatever that discussion is is the same today as it is right and then uh, when we talk about removing gaps on elm street and um in, in the bike trail so the, the bike lane gaps what concerns me is can, uh, particularly when you get up by the high school because the high school sucks up a lot of parking and to remove what spaces are there uh, puts more impact on residential streets because uh, right. e even though that's a captive audience the, the, we can't control the kids that drive their cars so they park all over the place right right so so that's part of the discussion I was looking at so all the things we have right now are often hybrids so if you think for example at Florence the shadows work through Florence to sort of warns you where the bicycles are and we not we're not giving up any of the parking spots in Florence but at least it's a continuous system you get to Florence and it's continuous the same thing on Elm Street when you leave State Street it, because we didn't want to lose parking on on Elm Street the first bit when you climb up the hill up to College Hall the bike lane is too narrow to be called a bike lane so it's technically called a shower at least there's, there's some marker from when you leave State Street all the way to when you get to the high school. It's discontinuous until you get to Florence again. So, mm -hmm. so the thinking is it should be continuous. That doesn't mean it's a dedicated lane. It might be a lane where you can. There's certainly places along Child's Park where we mm -hmm. could put a lane, and other places just a clear shallow lines to warn people. Because up in that area, parking is allowed, but it doesn't happen very often, right, right. so you wouldn't really notice. Right. Yeah, so think about the continuity as being a clear message for where we expect bicycles to go, but not necessarily a clear, consistent bike lane in every place there. And then the last one actually is relevant to our previous discussion about the, uh, about, about the planning board and the sort of discussions they have. Uh, and that is one of the objectives um, in Goal T2 to ensure that privately built streets include sidewalks consistent with the Northampton subdivision regulations when feasible and practical concrete sidewalks on two sides of a street are more desirable. But then we get into the cost of that and the fact that when we do stuff like that, it raises the price of housing. So on one hand, we, you know, one hand philosophically, it's a nice thing to have. On the other hand, it raises the cost of, right. of housing and we don't like that either so I mean that's a discussion more for the planning board right. they're the ones that deal with that so let me use as an example we passed you all passed maybe 10 years ago I'm not exactly sure the time um, a, dis a language about roundabouts and what the language says for roundabouts which we've been following religiously for the last decade is we always start with the assumption that a roundabout is the best solution because it's safer, there's less crashes. When it's crashes, it's less likely to be fatal. But often, it's not true. So it's sort of we start with that, and then we look at exceptions. So since we passed that, we put in two roundabouts, you know, Look Park and Con Street, and we have two under design. But at the same time, we added a signal by the state hospital. We added a signal at South Street and Route 10. Probably other signals that I'm not remembering offhand. So we sort of start with a default and saying, oh, well, by stop, uh, by uh, Big Y. So we added three signals, none of which were roundabouts, and we added two roundabouts in the same time period. But, but for the ones that were signals, every single one of those, we had a discussion. Could we do a roundabout in front of Big Y? No, didn't meet mass dot standards. Could we do one by Earl Street? No, because the river drops down and would use up land. So, it, so think of that language as, let's start the conversation saying, yes, we'd like concrete on both sides of the street, and then there's lots of reasons for exceptions. Mm -hmm. And I do want to compliment you about putting in there the intersection of Milton and Riverside and, and Elm, because that is a deadly intersection. And it's, you know, you've got high school kids going through there uh, and, young, you know, kids walking and also young drivers trying to negotiate a very awkward intersection. So I'm glad that one's a priority. We actually have a tiny parcel of tax title property there. And so we're looking at should we take that just because it's in back taxes, should we take it to add to the road right away to give us more options? To, to T, yeah, because that is very, very unsafe. And I've seen many times young drivers have a really hard time getting out of there safely. Yeah. All right, that's all my questions. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Any other discussion on this item? 
Roll call, please. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. All right. That passes in second reading. <clears throat> this is item 17.368. This is an order accepting lot four at Earl Street in Village Hill for municipal and other purposes. Move to approve. Second. Motions made and seconded. Discussion? Roll call, please. Uh, Councillor Fidwell. Uh, yeah. uh, Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shar. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. Item 17.369, this is an order authorizing the purchase of 55 acres on East Hampton Road and Route 10 uh, <clears throat> and Old Wilson Road for conservation, municipal, and other purposes. Second reading. Second. So you seconded it, but did someone make a motion? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Uh, discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. I'm still going to vote no on this one because I wish we exempted some of it for development, but I wish we'd exempted a little more. So I'm going to still vote no. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. And then uh, item 17.382 this is a warrant for November 7th, uh, 2017 election. Um, and I'm going to read this. This is upon the recommendation of Interim City Clerk Pamela L. Powers. And this is a warrant regarding the municipal election scheduled for November 7th, 2017. A meeting of, inha of the inhabitants of the City of Northampton qualified to vote will be held on Tuesday, November 7th, 2017, in the several polling places designated for the purposes <coughs> by the City Council as follows. Ward 1, Precinct A in Jackson Street School Auditorium. Ward 1, Precinct B, also in Jackson Street School Auditorium. Ward 2, Precinct A in Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Gymnasium. Ward 2, uh, Precinct B, also in Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Gymnasium. Ward 3, Precinct A in the Senior Center Great Room at 67 Conn Street. Ward 3, Precinct B in the Senior Center of the Great Room uh, and 67 Conn Street. Ward 4, Precinct A, that's in the Senior Center as well, Great Room, 67 Conn Street. Ward 4, Precinct B, in the Senior Center at the Great Room. Uh, Ward 5, Precinct A, in the Florence Civic and Business Building at 90 Park Street. And Ward 5, Precinct B, that will be at Smith Vocational Agricultural High School Gymnasium. Ward 6, Precinct A, in the Robert K. Finn Ryan Road School, and uh, that is true of Precinct B as well in Ward 6, Precinct uh, Ward 7, Precinct A, in the John F. Kennedy Middle School Community Room, and then Ward 7, Precinct B, in Leeds School Gymnasium at the lower level. The polls will be open at 7 o'clock on the forenoon and close at 8 o'clock on the evening of the said day, and all such voters will, within the said hours, in the wards in which they are individually entitled to vote, give in their votes for mayor for four ensuing uh, municipal years, for city clerk for the two ensuing municipal years, for two councillors at large for the two ensuing municipal years, for one councillor from each of the seven wards of the city for the two ensuing municipal years, for two members of the school committee at large for two years from the first Monday of January 2018, for one school committee member from uh, each of the seven wards of the city for two years from the first Monday of January 2018, and then also for three superintendents of the Smith's Agricultural School to serve for two years from the first Monday of January 2018, and also for one elector under the Oliver uh, Smith will for two years from the first Wednesday of May 2018, and for two trustees under the will of Charles E. Forbes for four years from the first Monday of 2018. Uh, I'll accept a motion. Any discussion on this? And the interim city clerk is here if you have any questions. Councilor Nash. I just want to say I love the, the language that it's it's a public meeting, an election. Yes. We're, we're all coming together for a meeting. That's all. <laughs> Get out there. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, any other discussion on those on this warrant? Okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. 
Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. yes. Councilor Kearney. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and will be up before us at our next meeting in September. Now we come to ordinances, and this is item 17.390. This is an ordinance to amend the zoning map 350-3.4 to expand the highway business district on North King Street. This is to refer to committee on uh, community resources and the committee on legislative matters. Move to refer both of these. Item B is agreed. So you want also by item B, which is 17.383. It's an ordinance to refine project categories for which local historic district review is required. And also that's to be referred to the Committee on Legislative Matters, do you think it should go to the Community Resources Committee as well? Um, I don't, but I would defer to the Chair of the C Committee on Community Resources. Would be happy to have it? <laughs> <laughs> Would be happy to have it? I'm, I'm just asking just for, since we're making... <laughs> Why not? All right. So then, then so be it. It will also, for <laughs> referral to uh, Community Resources. Um, any discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now we come up to the disclosure by a non-elected municipal employee of fi financial interest and determination by appointing authority as required by the general law, uh, Chapter 268A, Section 19. And this is, uh, and the interim city clerk is here for questions, but this is a, uh, um, Pam Powers, who was appointed, as you recall, to the interim city clerk position. Well, let me give some background on this. We've had no less than at least three, maybe four, <laughs> opinions from the state ethics board, um, sometimes in direct conflict with each other, and, and verbal opinions. So the, uh, Pam is awaiting a written opinion, which is not going to come in time for this disclaimer to work. <laughs> they may change their mind, we don't know. But this is a suspenders and belt kind of response, just erring on the side of caution. M Pam is declaring her conflict so that um, she can uh, affect certain, uh, start the election process. Um, some, which according to some, one of the opinions she would be excluded from. And now our most recent opinion, by declaring this uh, conflict and being accepted by us, the appointing authority, because we appointed for the purposes of the state, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but for the purposes of the state, they consider Pam not an elected official in her interim capacity, but as an appointed official by this department, being the city council. We, uh, in that respect, <laughs> different rules apply. My head has been, this has been driving me crazy. It's been driving us all crazy. And it's, and Pam has been very, has been assiduously cautious about how to proceed with this so not to create um, an appearance or a semblance or even any unintentional conflict. The most recent opinion that she has had suggests that she make this declaration. And then we, as the appointing authority, have to approve. Uh, her ability to continue to work in the capacity that we've appointed her to do. So that's what this discussion is. And um, the mayor is here. The mayor's been part of this discussion. Uh, Pam is here. She's, she's been neck deep in this as well. And if you have any other questions, or because I, you know, you should welcome the opportunity to become even further confused as this thing goes. But um, anyone have any questions relative to this? I mean, actually, first I would ask someone to put it on floor. I'll make a motion. motion. Okay. All right. Motions made and seconded. Okay. Uh, Councilor Carney, you first. <clears throat> Councilor Bidwell. I'm just trying to understand um, the necessity of this. Uh, I mean, the previous city clerk oversaw many municipal elections in which she was a candidate and had a financial interest in terms of being able to keep, That's true. keep her job um, should she. And so I'm my question is um, more one of, um, is it because this is, I mean, they were all, is it because it's a contested election? I mean. No, it's actually, ironically, uh, one of the opinions that was rendered indicated that um, the city clerk presiding over 
any election that has their name on the ballot is in conflict. It's an automatic conflict. So that would assume that the 12 or however many elections the previous city clerk that oversaw one were... one interpretation, yes. Okay. So it, it and this, is, this falls on... This is coming from that interpretation. This, the, so it's... But, but there's no harm in doing the disclosure or following this recommended. It's just that we didn't do that the dozen or so times that... Well, in, in, in fact, actually, this is an exemption that's unique. This is not an exemption. In fact, towns... There is a built-in, there's mass general law that allows exemptions for towns, not for cities, however. Um, it, and the irony here is the one uh, uh, retired city clerk, Maza, actually recused herself from one election. That was the one she was contested. Mm -hmm. Ironically, that's the one she didn't have to because she was not city clerk at the time. Um, the, it doesn't have to be a contested election. It has simply your name on the ballot. At least that's one opinion at this point. It, it, it's subject to change. The, the solicitor has some, some questions about that. My comment is we've only had 300 years to parse this out, and we haven't quite figured it out yet. But the, the, this is one of the strange anomalies that just gets stranger as we go. Councilor, oh, Councilor Bidwell was next. I'm, I'm, I'm fine providing a belt to go along with the suspenders or whatever. But, but my we put a motion on the floor. What is the motion? Are we are we acknowledging? We're, we're acknowledging and approving and, and actually in and, and actually and I'll, the determination by the appointing authority and appointing official would be us in in collectively. And I um, the what we are saying is that. We have reviewed, or I have reviewed, is what it says, the particular matter and the financial interest identified by a, above by the municipal employee. I have determined that the financial interest is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which uh, the municipality may expect from the employee. Is that statement? That's at towards the bottom. Towards, towards, towards the bottom of the uh, disclosure. Of the first of the oh, uh, no, second page. page. Yeah. So, so, so in fact, that, oh, the that, under determined that language what, is in fact. The motion. That's the motion. That's the motion, okay. yes. Okay. And I'm sorry, yeah. That, that's the clarification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Councilor O'Donnell and Councilor Murphy. On, on what opinion are we, are we basing this on? Exactly. This was Pam's most recent opinion from the State Ethics Board. A verbal opinion. Verbal opinion. She has requested a written, and they've said that they, it's the, Pam, 30 days? You've got another at least 30 days before they? Interestingly enough, I did get a Oh, do you want to you want to step up here and? and okay. Essentially, the um, the written opinion was exactly what I was told um, through uh, verbal means. Um, what the uh, state ethics has said is that my my position as the interim city clerk um, is one of an appointed position, and as an appointed um, employee, I can file this disclosure to. Um, state my financial interest and as long as the city council is in agreement with it then I can move forward and handle all of the election procedures. If you deny it then um, we would have to figure out a different way to resolve the issue about who's going to oversee the election. Um, this only applies because I have been appointed once the election takes place and whoever it is that is the city clerk uh, the conflict then comes into play again, and then you would need to figure out how to address that conflict. A good question to that, to that point. The conflict comes into effect every two years whenever the city clerk runs is, for election? Is on the ballot, yes. Um, is on the what? Is on, is on the, the ballot. ballot. So does that, so in general, um, without, the, so cities or towns that don't, um, approve or recognize, make this determination, would have to find someone else to oversee their elections typically well, no. than their the city clerk? No. The, the conflict, the law indicates that this only applies to cities. S and some cities have appointed city clerks. So those oh, would I not see. be in conflict. I see. It's the ones that to all the cities. Grade us to I, a town. One at a time, one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the ones that are uh, elected city clerks who would be in conflict. So in every city that there's an elected city clerk, that city clerk has to do a similar 
uh, financial disclosure in order to no. for the city run well, the city's election. Well, no. that, that's based on the opinion that I received from state uh, ethics. Well, that's an appointed city clerk by the city council. It's not an elected city clerk. It's a completely different. Well, there's two different chapters of the law here. Well, that's why I just asked. She right. said it's selected, though. No, I, I believe there are two different. Yeah. Um, because Pam now functions as a city employee, but under our yes. aegis. I, right. It would be different as an elected appointee. They would still have to declare their conflict, but under a different. Okay. It, it's. So it's not the same determination. Same. It's not the same determination, of, and it's I, not anywhere near. I don't near have that ability to do that. To 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 issue. We wouldn't. It wouldn't come before us. You wouldn't make the declaration before us because you're an elected official at that point, and it's not. And the, we have no authority over. We wouldn't mm -hmm. be. It wouldn't be under our authority. The only reason that we're discussing this and, and, and this becomes up an issue is because we're the appointing authority. Beyond that, it's an elected position. And then at that point, we better hear from the state ethics board pronto because then it comes up to Every two the years. electorate. The electorate has to approve the conflict or something, which is bizarre. Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. From, from the opinion, However, if you are elected as the city clerk in November 2017, please note that you will not be eligible to use the 19B1 exemption in the future because you will no longer be an appointed em right. municipal employee, but rather you would be an elected municipal employee, and as such, you will be ineligible for the 19B1 exemption. That's right. Okay. So there would be no qualification. There is oh, no Oh, so there's no conflict. Process. There's no conflict for an, for an elected no, city clerk. No, there is a conflict. There's no exemption. There's no exemption. So no elected city clerk may run a city election. Unless you're a town clerk. Unless you're a town clerk, but a city no clerk. No city clerks run elections. <clears throat> no. I don't know the answer to that. Here's the problem. This is where it comes in conflict with our charter. It comes in conflict with existing state law it, because the law actually, uh, Massachusetts general law requires the city clerk to preside over financial, uh, the uh, finance statements of, uh, of a campaign. The state says that. But at the same time, now they're saying if you're an elected city council, uh, a city clerk, you can't. You can't touch it. You're in conflict. And then you are literally a significant portion of your job is rendered moot. And this is why the state ethics board has to clear this up or alternately, and this is another agenda item for some other discussion for other time, remove this as an elected position. So, uh, yeah, Councilor Donald. When does this happen? <laughs> When does this have to be voted on by the council? Um, because I there's not we, in a hurry with this. We understand what the letter about this um, exemption is, but I I didn't understand I was going to be voting on this tonight. And so, what is the guidance for the city? Well, council? the the urgency part of the urgency, of course, is M can't do anything relative to the election. Uh, the until until we say so. However, there's been training, I understand. Uh, Amy could handle some of it, some of it, no. Well, I, I haven't trained her. Oh, OK. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what uh, experience that she has running the election under Wendy's uh, guidance. Um, the, we are calling in the state on September 11th. They'll be coming in to uh, train all of the employees on the state's computer system. Um, and that, you know, that's something that everyone is going to be participating in and will benefit from. But um, ordering the machines, the ballots, uh, all that stuff, you will not be able to do until we recognize and acknowledge your conflict. And Correct. So, to follow it, up, when does this have to be done? Right. Well, uh, as soon as possible, you know, as yeah. well, we're here. As soon as we're in September. We <laughs> well, uh, it's, le it's, it's uh, 61 days until the election. Um, by the time the city council meets again, four days later will be when the you know the uh, selections get drawn for the uh, positions on the ballot. Um, it's it. Uh, hang on a sec. Council Murphy's next, and then uh, then with Council Labarge and Council Bidwell. Uh, you know, I no, also, you can finish. Yeah. I also wanted to say that you know, there's also the, you know, the getting ready of the employees. The you know the, um, the state just issued new election laws. The um, election workers need to be trained in those laws. So there's a lot of work to be done between now and and November seventh. Council Murphy. So I I don't see the conundrums or leap of faith here. I mean, we just appointed 
Pam to be the interim city clerk knowing full well that there was an election around the corner, right? So what's the <coughs> surprise here? We appointed her to be city clerk with the understanding there was an election coming and that she was a candidate in that election, right? So all we're going to do is acknowledge the fact that, yes, we know you're a candidate. And knowing that, we appointed you to this position because we had faith in the fact you could execute the job impartially, even though you're on the ballot. So I don't see the leap of faith here. And then the Commonwealth, the rocket scientists in Boston, have two years to figure out how to solve what is essentially their problem with their conflicting laws. I mean, it's kind of their problem. One statute says this, one statute says that. And it's not just our problem. It's the problem of every city in Massachusetts that elects a city clerk. You know, I think it's not a leap of faith for me because we just did this knowing this was going to happen. We're just acknowledging when we appointed you, we knew this was going to happen. And we stand by that appointment. We trust your ability to do it. And then we let, as I said, those wise folks at the end of the turf I figure out the other problem because it's their problem, not our problem. Yeah, More that's well. usually how that works. <laughs> well, maybe maybe they can do it in two years. Luckily, it's I'm not sure the you're right. As they I said, they've only had 300 years. Uh, Council LaBarge. Um, I don't know where to go with this. I'm just so confused with this. Is, uh, do you have any questions that I can help you with? Yeah, I heard you say something about, say for an example, with our previous city clerk. Okay, she was an elected position, okay, and she didn't have any candidates, but like you said, a one-shot deal, she did, that was legal. So I'm confused with that remark versus her being in office. Well, the requirement is, if your name is on the ballot, according to the State Ethics Board, you cannot participate in any process that involves the election if beyond your campaign. And without the dis without the no, there's no exemption. Oh, uh, no, yeah, exemption no exemption for an elected. Right. Wendy recused herself when she was assistant city clerk to run. I remember. Uh, so there wouldn't be a conflict, but that was not required then, because she wasn't the city clerk, so she wasn't standing in conflict. She was merely a candidate. Um, and Chris Skorupski was the city clerk at the time right. and would be presiding over that election. So. The, in the state's opinion that um, a system that they actually set up, that there is a built-in conflict that can't be rectified um, in, in um, elected city clerks. So there is the problem. So um, regardless of who, as, as Pam points out, regardless who wins this election, they will always be standing, as long as they're elected, according to the state, will always be in conflict and cannot participate in the election process beyond their campaigning. So right now, she would not be able to? No, in this case, <laughs> yes, she would be she able to because she's appointed, appointed by us. We yes. presumed under our charter that that qualifies as an election. She was elected to the position and, were, and she was being treated as an elected official. So and then we found out this issue about the state's conflict and then this whole issue about the exemptions. I know I'm not clearing this up, but it's uh, <laughs> the, the fact remains is that because she's appointed, she actually qualifies for an exemption because she's appointed by us. She is not an elected official in the eyes of the state. So then she can go ahead and go into the schools, we, check the ballots and all that? Well, so that is that's is something to be discussed about how Pam would, yeah, how, how so. Pam would conduct uh, herself. We, but. we did have a discussion about that, about some of the you know activities that are performed by the city clerk before, during, and after the election. And one of the things that um, Nora, her name is Nora Malam, made clear is that I, I can't go to the pol polling places on election day. That is absolutely something that cannot be done um, as a candidate on the ballot. And what so. about the counting of the absentee ballots? Right. That, that was not an issue. Um, they're sealed. There is, a, you know, some, I think uh, practices that we need to put in place for the chain of custody of the ballots. Um, but in terms of executing the, uh, the, you know, getting people 
in handling their um, absentee ballots to help them fill them out is not a concern. But, the, but, but from my perspective, the chain of custody is something that we need to sort of address. Right, you mentioned that yeah. to me. Uh, Councilor Bidwell. I would just like to make the point that there's nothing we can do about previous elections. Right. We don't know what's going to happen by way of additional opinions between now and the next election. All we are here to do is to <laughs> vote on this particular um, uh, declaration, uh, which clearly in the language of that opinion is what we need to do. And I would suggest we just focus on that, take the vote, and let the rest of it be for other discussion. Any other comments on this? Or any other questions? Um, okay. So I'm going to ask for a roll call on this one. Do you want to read the motion again, just so that we know? Well, the motion, actually, it's Pam has revealed to us this disclosure, but ultimately what we are approving is this language here. Right. As appointing official, and, and in fact, this is boilerplate, obviously, as I read it, and I still haven't figured out how we're supposed to assign this, but as appointing official as required by general law, chapter 268A, section 19, I have reviewed the particular matter and the financial interest identified above by a municipal employee. I have determined that the financial interest is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services with the municipality may expect from the employee. Okay. That's okay. That right. the motion. So that's essentially yes, that's the, motion. the motion. Councilor Shara. So, but how are we going to sign this? Because it has to be signed before we um, authorizing. Yeah. yeah. I, if, so the motion, yes, if you want to craft the motion, yes. you authorize. I'll, I'll just say it as, as it was spoken with the preceding language, authorizing the president to. Yes. Signature. Okay. There's a word says, I have. Okay. Yes, sir. There's, there's a tiny space for comment, which I actually plan on using. But, um, <laughs> it's, uh, Please. Uh, uh, Councilor Nash. I just uh, real briefly, I stand by Ms. Power's integrity to pull this off and, you know, as, as I did when I voted, you know, when did we vote? A month and a half ago? So uh, that hasn't changed. I, I, that was uh, up for, that was in on my mind even then, you know, uh, so I, I'm, it, I'm taking the same vote. Uh, worth noting, of course, there were no other candidates for the position. But um, any other discussion, questions? Okay, so th the vote is for to authorize me to sign this declaration by which we agree that we accept. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Roll call, please. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Barge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Abstain. Councillor. Abstain? Yeah. Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Okay. So, uh, and I, this will not require a second reading, I don't believe. Thank God. So, um, because again, it's an anomaly. I've never, we've never done this before. We're never going to do it again because it's, well, I hope, but, um, yeah, we'll need some charter review as well, I think. that. All right. So that all done. I have no other updates. Uh, any committee chairs on any updates? Meeting announcements? No. Uh, no information requests or committee study requests. No new business. So that leaves us with just one thing to do. Move adjourn. That's it. Hello. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Thank you.